Hello everyone, and welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And it is time once again for a brand new update special to my series on paleoanthropology, Humanity of Prologue. So this is now volume two. Mm -hmm. um, it's been about a year since the last one, and in a field such as this, where there's always new research being done, we have a plethora of new stories and new discoveries that we're going to get to share with you today. Um, but before we do that, uh, Albert, how have things been on your end? Yeah, uh, well, let me think. I, I guess the, the biggest thing is that um, I am making this recording from a very different time zone than usual. Um, I have uh, finally had an opportunity to fly back to Taiwan to visit my family. Um, it's been quite interesting. It's been it's been nice to be back since I, I haven't been back for years, uh, largely because of the pandemic. Um, and also finishing up the PhD, of course. I guess I haven't really done too much beyond seeing people and hanging out, but uh, I am pretty excited to uh, hear from you regarding this update special, because, uh, yeah, it's definitely about time for that. Oh, yeah, and uh, that's really been, like, the biggest thing that I've been working on, you know, as of, since the last time we have met, um, because, the, of course, this is one of those things where there's so much stuff that has been published in yeah. the time since the last update special that one of the hardest things is just picking which stories to talk mm. about and which ones to prioritize um so that's been a lot of fun um this is always a field that, that keeps you on your toes yeah um but like other than that you know i've been kind of chilling out as well um doing the pop culture thing as usual just keeping up with all kinds of shows i'm having a good time um there have been some really exciting like new and ongoing projects that I feel like it should be good to mention. Um, so uh, Albert, you had brought my attention to this not too long ago, um, but we have our first teaser out for the next of the Planet Earth franchise BBC documentaries, uh, Frozen Planet 2. Mm -hmm. So they just dropped the trailer um, and it's mainly, you know, a selection of images from the upcoming series. Um, it looks like Hans Zimmer is back yet again to do the orchestration for this program. Um, and there's also like a, an original song by Camila Cabello, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of a, a fun collaboration. Right. Um, but I'm really interested in, in this new, um, this, this sequel, because I remember seeing the first Frozen Planet, yep. mm. um, but it's been a little bit of a while for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I'm definitely very do for a rewatch um which is which is especially helpful now because i had recently found the dvd um for like dirt cheap it was an absolute steal mm. so i'll be able to like check those out and see you know when the time comes uh how it will compare because of course with frozen planet the original it essentially focuses on like the polar regions yeah. of the mm. world if that, if that if the title didn't kind of give that away uh, so he spent a lot of time in the Arctic Circle and in the Antarctic um, and how like the different wildlife that live on those two regions, you know, survive in such a harsh environment. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, a lot of pioneering, beautifully done cinematography. And so it looks like this is definitely going to be an update to that, the even more advanced technology and also some new behaviors, too. Um, and one thing I noticed, and maybe I have to this will this will be something where I'll, I'll go back to the original series to just confirm, but it looks like that they've kind of expanded the scope yes. of Frozen Planet a little bit, this one, because there were some scenes in the trailer where like a chameleon shows yep. up. And for a second there, I'm like, wait a minute, because, <laughs> you know, uh, chameleons aren't exactly, you know, polar region right. animals. Um, so it's looking like they're going to just kind of explore like cool climates and cool yes. environments in general. Um, to kind of round all this out, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, I mean, it's definitely a good way to kind of, you know, make it unique. Yeah. Because I, I remember even in the first um, Frozen Planet, like, they did kind of extend the boundary of the Arctic yeah, a little yeah. bit yeah. Mm -hmm. to include, like, um, you know, the, the boreal forests right. and the taiga. Um, cause I, remember, I remember there was a sequence with, like, bison and wolves that mm -hmm. was really well done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like they're going to they're gonna do even more with that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely looking forward to it. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, uh, I, I think um, I'm 
I noticed that that as well. Like that, that also struck me um, that it it seems quite evident in this trailer that uh, they are they are not sticking strictly to just the Arctic and the Antarctic, but are covering like all kinds of um, probably cool and cold environments around the world. Um, is yeah, like Chameleon. I'm pretty curious about because I, I wonder what where that was filmed. Um, but uh, one that I I did um, kind of particularly notice was the Lakia parrots, uh, which of course are from New Zealand and they live high up in the mountains. So you know they live in cold environments, so it fits the theme. But uh, it definitely definitely shows that they are kind of expanding the scope of it a little bit. And yeah, I think you're right. They they did they did cover things like the boreal forest in the previous one too. So it's not entirely unprecedented. Um, but uh, yeah, it seems seems like they are covering it. You know, kind of expanding it even more this time and yeah i agree that's nice because yeah first of all like you said it does make it more unique um because you know as much uh as i enjoy watching arctic and antarctic scenes and as important as it is to raise awareness of those ecosystems and the threats that they face i i have to say you know <laughs> it it does it can get a bit repetitive seeing the same species over and over again um and I, I think it is also important to highlight the fact that it is really a cold environment all over the world. Like, um, plates, for example, the frozen frozen mountaintops and alpine regions, um, they they are also under threat from global warming, just like uh, the poles are. So, yeah, no, I, I think it was a great decision to expand the scope in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm definitely hoping that, you know, the conservation message will be like, definitely forefront as well um because i'm definitely getting hints of that in the trailer too because mm -hmm. they, they show some time lapse of glacier events, right um which is yeah that that's i mean of course you can always go back to um the finale of humanity of prologue we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. the the collapse of ice around the world um but i just hope that like this time around like the the higher ups will have learned their lesson um because i know with the first frozen planet when they came to the states I think they like they chopped off the last episode. Oh my god, yeah, that's right. Which was nothing but you know climate change research mm -hmm. and how it affects you know, the polar regions. Yeah. Um, which yeah, that was a, that was a stupid move. Um, but you know we, we've been getting more you know conservation media in the states in, in recent times, which is certainly a great thing. So hopefully, like they will leave this series alone when it eventually comes over to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, because for now, um, based on what I'm reading. It looks like we're looking uh, for a September 11th release in the UK, mm. um, which is like soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very soon. Um, so y'all will almost certainly uh, hear more about that from us mm. when the time comes. Cause, uh, I'll definitely you know, find a way to watch those and keep up with it. Because again, like, I, if you remember our comments from the Green Planet, you know, th th these BBC documentaries have been really great. Yeah. yeah, as of late, the, I'm, I'm I'm sure this one's going to be uh, another winner. Um, so we will definitely see. Um, now, in terms of like ongoing projects that you know we've been excited about, about well, I've, I've certainly been following this closely. So, um, fellow natural history YouTubers uh, Benji Thomas and Doug James, um, they have been releasing a series of videos called uh, Ben and Doug's South African Adventure. Mm -hmm. They had an opportunity to go visit the Cradle of Humankind um, archaeological site and spend some time there out in the, um, you know, out in South Africa, like exploring the paleontology and archaeology of the region. So they've been releasing a series of videos. Um, there's three of them now. Um, apparently there's going to be six of them in total. So we're about halfway through, but um, they've been highlighting like the not just like the hominin discoveries in that part of the world. Um, especially in recent years, we have Homo naledi and uh, Australopithecus sediba, or what I call Homo sediba, um, but also the um, the extensive history of uh, proto mammals, the rhapsids, that have been found in the South African site. So they've been sharing a lot of those, and um, what's really cool is that apparently um, Ben you know, used the kind of the, the reach of his YouTube channel mm. to like really help contribute to research in that area. Um, they managed to crowdfund 
ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars for students at the University of uh, Witwatersrand um, to help fund their uh, a, a research trip involving uh, Permian therapsids. Um, and so, like, I, I heard about that, and I was like, "Wow, that's amazing!" Because um, there's a lot of dis- uh, disenfranchised, disadvantaged students in South Africa right. who want to, you know, do these research trips, but they just don't have the funds. So the fact that they were able to help with at least this this research project, you know, that's that's really cool. And I, I give them a lot of credit and respect. Um, they've put out some really wonderful videos sharing some some cool fossils and some of the cool museums and sites there and the wildlife in the region. Um, so we definitely want to give them a shout out. Um, we will link their three episodes that have aired for now in the description. And so if you if y'all like hominins and and uh, uh, the rapsid proto mammals, and you want to kind of see more of them in in a uh, archaeological and paleontological context with like people behind the discoveries, I, I definitely recommend checking them out because hmm. um, uh, I'm I'm really amazed and impressed, and I'm just thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> like like for the most part i'm just thrilled that they got to have this experience mm-hmm. in the first place um it's really fantastic um albert is there anything you'd like to add oh uh well i i haven't watched the videos yet but i do remember when the crowdfunding was going around and yeah i'm very glad that you know they kind of uh took the opportunity to like you said like support the the research in the region and um, it's fantastic that they that they made their uh, their goal and more, um, and yeah, I'm sure it is a fantastic experience for them to to go on those trips, and I, I think it's a it's a real win all around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, definitely, you know, big props, Ben and Doug, y'all are amazing. Um, but now we're gonna move on because we have some very exciting news. Um, for some of you who may, might be keeping track of you know famous dates and through time and clade's history. Um, If you go to the next slide, you will see that we had our two-year anniversary um, last Tuesday. Um, Oh, my gosh. Two years. Um, ah, Wow. It's... it's, Sometimes it's hard to find the words, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? Um, I mean, we are so grateful for all of you who have tuned in with us over all this time. Um... If you see from our little banner screenshot here, um, as of the time of recording, we've hit 990 subscribers. Mm -hmm. Our audience has just grown significantly. Um, From the last time we had our one-year anniversary, we had 439 followers. (laughs) So that has just skyrocketed there. Um, And the amount of views, too. So when we had our first-year anniversary, we were at about uh, over... 20,900 views um but now we've at we've surpassed 45,800 wow so mm-hmm. like that viewership has like more than doubled yeah um and it's looking like it's continuing to grow as we speak so we're really glad to hear that um my goodness uh even though we haven't had any of our you know long format lecture series you know like this the second year of, of of our programs has not always had some very exciting and and fun projects as well mm-hmm. as we've expanded our our format. Um, of course, one of the big highlights was our interview on March fifteenth with Miles Greb and Trey the Explainer. Mm-hmm. Um, I still think back to that one every now and then. Uh, just two just two awesome individuals that it was really fun to kind of get their their perspectives on their lives and all of their various work that they've done. Um, of course, we had uh, we started our review episodes yep. hmm. for this second year, um, which kickstarted with the dawn of everything, and then went to the story of Kareen, which was a wonderful animated series from Japan that uh, still just you know kind of warms my heart <laughs> thinking about it. Um, then, of course, we had a a, a review for Encanto, <laughs> the latest Walt Disney Animation Studios film, which was probably one of our longer reviews yeah. um, so the first time we, we ended up splitting up an episode into three parts um because we just we just had so much to say and yeah. share um granted it has been a while since i've seen the film um i actually wanted to make sure i didn't overwhelm myself too much with <laughs> mm. the movie so I, I purposely like not gone back in a while to just keep it fresh um it's like that, that's the last thing i want is burnout yeah for a property that i like 
Um, oh gosh, that, that's not that's not fun. Um, but then we also you know had our most recent review episode, which was the defunct paleontology <laughs> website. That's funny. Which, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Albert, you kind of spearheaded that one, and and we really, you know had a nostalgic look back at a lot of these sites which influenced us over the years uh, just an absolute delight some fun stuff there um and then of course like we were invited to paleo rewind to participate in the second half of july uh, portion of that whole program um my goodness I, I am still very grateful and 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 happy that we were able to contribute to that mm -hmm. um that you know our channel was at a point where we were getting noticed by fellow natural history YouTubers to kind of collaborate with them and join in, um, mm -hmm. which is just a real treat. And it's a really awesome series as well. The paleo rewinds, basically the entire previous year is summarized by different YouTubers and, you know, highlight stories from all that time are covered a wide range of paleontology discoveries. And so it was really cool to help kind of contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely it, it's been, you know, it's been kind of a slow second year, but it hasn't been an uneventful second oh, yeah, year, definitely. If, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Do, do you have any thoughts about how we, we, we made it to two years? Oh my, uh, I, I think you covered the highlights really well. I don't, I don't have too much to add to that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, as you might have noticed, um, we didn't prepare an entire episode on the anniversary this year, like we, unlike what we did for last year. Um, yeah, the ti timing didn't work out too well because end of August was around the time I was flying to Taiwan and, you know, having to deal with jet lag and uh, just uh, catching up with family and all that uh, wouldn't, wouldn't have worked out too well. But um, yeah, no, we are still very happy to have reached this point and I think uh, we did a lot of fun things uh, and tried some new directions for the show uh, over this uh, second year. Um, and as always, we are very, very grateful to everyone who listens and uh, to us and supports us yeah hmm. absolutely and uh definitely here's to another two years and beyond um we're definitely thinking yeah maybe maybe if we reach five years <laughs> um we'll do another big episode like we did before with like q and a's and and you know, special sneak peeks and stuff but uh no like the our, like our spirit of like trying new things and just bringing fascinating discoveries in zoology and geology and, and deep time to our audience we um we're definitely going to continue that so uh, the, the fire is still going strong um, so definitely look forward to um more wonderful episodes and new experiments down the line so yeah here raise a glass two-year anniversary <laughs> glug 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 that is fantastic um now before we jump into the update special itself there is one more important thing that we wanted to cover um if we jump to the next slide um our previous episode i had had the idea to do a little special segment on jaguars in the united states and their history as a big cat in that region uh, until fairly recently um and a partial inspiration for that or actually a, a huge inspiration for that was this piece by a paleo artist drew franklin um, now, uh, this depicts, um, as you can see in the tweet to the left, this is an oil painting. So this is a jaguar that is hunting in Colorado during the 1700s. He's just brought down a massive bull elk. And for some of you might be wondering, wow, that's kind of a strange image. Well, if the historical and ethnographic records are anything to go by, there were indeed jaguars this far north. Um, not too long ago, and in fact, over a wide range of the United States. Um, but of course, you can learn more about that in our previous um, July news special mm -hmm. for uh, humanity um, for through time and clades. Um, so we, we we mentioned Drew Franklin's piece, but now we're actually featuring it here. Because um, incidentally, I did like message him uh, as we were preparing for that news episode, like, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could include this image?" Um, but, you know, like, you know, Drew's been busy, so he didn't get back to me in time. But uh, I, I managed to follow up with him, and he was more than happy to have us share his piece there. Mm -hmm. And so here we are today. Um, I mean, it's, it's a beautifully done piece. Um, it definitely is a provocative image that makes you want to, like, go deeper into, you know, the story behind Jaguars in the United States, which is why we did the special the way that we did. So I'm really happy to feature this here. 
Um, Drew, it's a wonderful piece. Thank you again for letting us feature it here on our program. Mm -hmm. um, Albert, do you have anything you'd like to add? Not really, but uh, I agree with you. It is a wonderful piece. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So many thanks again, Drew. Um, and definitely, if you want to learn more about Jaguars in the United States, please check out our July 2022 news uh, episode. This is the most. This is the previous one from this recording, and you can learn more about that. Um, but yes, now it is time where we jump into the world of paleoanthropology. Right. So let's do it. We'll go to the next slide. Um, okay. So uh, this slide here emphasizes the important role that scientific discoveries are, you know, not always going to be the big news items in the field of paleo, uh, in the field of paleoanthropology. Mm -hmm. um, just as crucial are shifts in thinking and understanding, you know, in how we do anthropology and how we talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so there were three updates in particular that stood out there. So uh, paleoanthropologist Chris Stringer has been on the forefront of research regarding the Middle Pleistocene and the various hominin species and specimens that have been found within that span of time, particularly since you know that was when Homo sapiens, our species, evolved. Now, in terms of language used, it has been a bit of a tradition to talk about archaic humans and modern humans, mm -hmm. the former representing things like Neanderthals, so-called Homo heidelbergensis, and others, while the latter represents living humans today, as well as archaeological remains that sport so-called anatomically modern features. Right. Now, this has been a point of contention for some time, partly because it was never really clear how best to define these terms, mm -hmm. um, partly because terms like modern are often linked with ideas about modern human behavior, and partially because there's a lot of social and political issues regarding things like like terms like archaic um and especially since so-called modern human behaviors have seemed to have been present in so-called archaic species in the past so those lines have definitely been heavily blurred right um so in preparation for an upcoming paper uh, chris stringer had actually sent out a tweet on april 12th of this year where he outlines a newly proposed terminology at least for paleoanthropology that better takes into account these sorts of critiques. And so if you follow Stringer on Twitter, um, he doesn't make Twitter threads. He will like t type out whole paragraphs with his thoughts oh, and right. just kind of screenshot them and put them right. <laughs> up. So um, I guess it's a little bit easier than having to unroll a thread, um, but it's kind of like a quirk of his, which is, is yeah, it, it's cool. Hmm. Cause he always like, he puts citations in there too. It's, it's, it's helpful, um, but okay. So basically, Stringer is actually drawing from cladistics, which is like, oh my god, cladistics and paleoanthropology? <laughs> it's a match made in heaven. Um, he has chosen the word apomorphic in place of modern and plesiomorphic in place of archaic. Mm -hmm. So in the world of phylogenetics, um, to have plesiomorphic traits are to retain ancestral anatomical characters, mm -hmm. while species with apomorphic traits have specialized or derived anatomical features that are unique to that lineage. So in using these terms, something like the Jebel Earhout skull from Morocco, which is dated 315,000 years ago, would be called a plesiomorphic homo sapiens due to the elongated skull shape and the, the thick brow ridges, which aren't present in homo sapiens today. Um, while, say, more recent fossils of Neanderthals from the last 60,000 years or so would be called apomorphic Homo neanderthalensis. So to compare them with more plesiomorphic Neanderthals, like those at uh, Cima de los Huesos, which are far older remains. Um, so those are kind of examples of how these terms would be used. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also a bit of an aside by him regarding how to talk about admixture between hominin species. Mm. Um, Stringer has proposed that it would be better to be specific when talking about interbreeding events instead of using the generic term archaic integration mm. that often appears in papers that talk about this. So, for example, um, if you want to talk about Neanderthal and Homo sapiens admixture, you would rather say Neanderthal lineage introgression 
instead of having to put the archaic in there. And so the responses to this tweet have been, I'd say, fairly mixed. Mm. Um, there are many positive comments mm -hmm. versus others who are a little bit more concerned about using this approach in science communication. Mm. Um, or they feel that it will take some time to get used to terms like that to right. begin with. Um, because like archaic and modern are like fairly common English terms, mm -hmm. but having to mention apomorphic and plesiomorphic <laughs> and having to like define those, it might be a little bit of a head scratcher for some folks. Right, right. Um, on my end of things, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm more open to any attempts to, you know, remove terms like archaic mm -hmm. and, and primitive from the anthropological lexicon, because those have had a long history um, and often for worse. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, if this is the way to go, like, I'm down. Um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you at a kind of terms like these can be very misleading to people when thinking about evolution. And certainly terms like um, apomorphic and plesiomorphic, they uh, are, at least from a technical literature standpoint, are more in line with what other evolutionary biologists tend to use anyway. Um, so, yeah, I, I, in general, I, I am more on board with using uh, these terms that he's proposing here. Um, but I, 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 do, I do get the point that, yeah, these terms are not intuitive to lay people and uh, the use in scientific communication would require um, further explanation, I think. Um, so, yeah, but it, it is good to see, you know, people are thinking about this in the field of anthropology uh, because, yeah, I, I agree. I, kind of terms like archaic and modern come with a lot of baggage uh on multiple fronts um and so it, it it is it is at least good to think about alternatives for sure oh yeah and um definitely like a lot of this has come from within the field as well um like there's a there's an article by anthropologist john hawks that really made me chuckle because it's true um you rarely if ever see terms like archaic and modern used for other mammals mm -hmm. Um, so it's like, you know, nobody's talking about anatomically modern elephants. Mm -hmm. that, that was that was his example, because it, it kind of sounds silly, you know, um, it, but like, these terms are just prevalent in paleoanthropology. And, and it's just one of those things that kind of further separates the field from the rest of paleomomology more than it probably should. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I definitely, I'm on board with this. And uh, I see like Chris Stringer is making an effort to like incorporate these into his terminology too. I know some other paleoanthropologists are as mm. well. Mm. So baby steps, but hopefully in the right direction. Um, so next up, uh, we have an actual paper from August, 2021. So authors Anne H. Ross and Marine Palud are calling for a language reform in forensic anthropology, mm. uh, which is the subfield that uses knowledge of the human body in legal cases like homicides. Um, if you watch something like the TV show Bones, that's exactly what that is, you know, minus all the action scenes, mm. um, <laughs> which is funny because interestingly, a, um, a forensic anthropologist, uh, Kathy Reich, was the producer of that series. Oh, huh. <laughs> it's kind of a little known fact there. Um, so uh, the use of terms in forensic anthropology, like race and ethnicity and ancestry, that has a long history. And it was still one of the few subfields of anthropology that will try to use race determination on remains until fairly recently. Um, it wasn't until the 1990s and the early 2000s that forensic anthropologists were, you know, actually called to face this and um, kind of shift the focus to perhaps ancestry determination mm -hmm. instead. You know, after the rise of molecular studies have helped to kind of diminish the concept of race in human biology. Um, but unfortunately, that shift in focus ended up more like a shift in just words, because the way these researchers were using the term ancestry was basically the same as how they were using race. Right, <laughs> they right. just kind of swapped the labels there. Um, you know, they were still thinking in terms of topologies instead of genetic history. Mm. So now uh, the paper authors here are calling for a proper reform in the language that better reflects these recent understandings. So instead of talking about continental groupings and other racial terms, it would be 
better for forensic anthropologists to think about population affinities, you know, using statistical models to show how human groups moved and interacted in the past to create the ancestries of people today, which we know could be very fluid indeed. And instead of looking at cranial features or, or dental characters or morphometrics as equally informative sources of identification, um, it would be better for forensic anthropologists to consider trait selection. So looking at features in an evolutionary context to see whether they are, say, autapomorphies or ancestral traits, um, or you know whether some features that were thought to be distinct in some populations actually show a wide distribution across regions. Um, and these must be understood as fluidly and fully as they can be. Um, and of course, when considering population, you know, it would be good to be as specific as possible as well. Um, so like a forensic anthropologist cannot just label a population of humans as African or European or Asian. You know, those are entire continents or regions of continents that have substantial diversity within them. And so it, uh, there's a bit of a bias there. Um, and like, honestly, it, it's amazing how much this antiquated terminology has stayed around in the field, um, as it is prone to really insane inaccuracies and often miscommunication um, and mistakes. So I experienced this in college once. Um, so I had a biological anthropology lab course, which supplemented the biological anthropology class, hmm. where we would like follow up on topics in that class in a more hands-on approach. So like we, we would look at skull casts and fossil casts and, and do sorts of activities to kind of supplement our information there. Um, and we got to the forensic section of that class, um, of that lab. Uh, we were given a, a skull cast. I, I, think, I think it was a cast. And the professor was like, okay, you have these um, little key charts that tell you about different features that you measurements that you can make and find out, you know, what's the ancestry of this guy. And so uh, we got into teams and we did that. And by the end of it, there was a firm divide in the class between those of us who thought that the skull belonged to a white person mm -hmm. and those that thought it belonged to a black person. Mm -hmm. And there was a little bit of arguing back and forth. And finally, the professor's like, okay, you want to know who this guy is? <laughs> He's Hawaiian. <laughs> so we were like, oh, wow, we did not even go in that direction. Right. Um, uh, which is interesting because... Um, you know, Hawaiian or Pacific Islander or Polynesian was not on that key chart. Mm. So, yeah, it, it just goes to show how important such changes as this need to be. Um, so lastly, uh, we have a really insightful paper from January 2022 by four authors. So Jesus Piqueres, uh, Miriam Ashiam, Susiana Edval, and Charlotte Eek. They wanted to see how the general public might perceive museum exhibits on human evolution hmm. with their worldviews on ethnicity and gender. So working with a team of 33 teenage students, they had them visit the Human Journey exhibit at the Swedish Museum of Natural History in Stockholm, observe three of their full-body hominin restorations done by paleoartist Elizabeth Danes. Um, so they had a Paranthropus afarensis pair, they had a young homo ergaster, and they had a Neanderthal family, mm. which is pictured here on the slide. Um, and they, they had the students write down any questions they had and then talk amongst themselves for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and, and all this was you know, recorded and, and with transcripts posted as well. Here, here's one on the bottom left. So you can clearly get the discussion recorded. And then the students had to give presentations on their observations as well as well as consult with a museum educator and so what really struck the authors during this entire experiment was the finding that while any implications about ethnicity and race the students took from the exhibits were treated as solid evidence of past human evolution hmm. when it came to gender the students were much more hesitant and skeptical hmm. at what they saw so like specific details from each exhibit were scrutinized and noticed um you know even where the paleo artist was using speculation right um which goes to show that you know such reconstructions while they're certainly beautiful 
to look at, you know, they can be treated as, you know, more than the artists may have intended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it would help to be absolutely clear what parts of a reconstruction are based on fossil or genetic evidence and which are not, which is definitely up to the museum labels to kind of put that there in the forefront. Um, <laughs> and of course, it, it doesn't help when you plan out exhibits that begin with darker skinned African australopithecines mm -hmm. and end with lighter skinned European Neanderthals right. or sapiens with complex cultures. <laughs> um, yeah, this can um, lead to very inaccurate and harmful reflections right. of human evolution. But it's strange that the students didn't question that one bit, and they kind of took it as fact. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, contrast that with the students' takes on gender, where you know they questioned the layout of the reconstructions. So, like in this Neanderthal um, diorama here. Uh, they they questioned how the female Neanderthal seemed to be portrayed as more submissive than the male who is carrying a large piece of game. Mm. Uh, now you know those observations alone are some cause for joy that you know you know people are going to these exhibits and they're actually engaging with them in that front. Um, but it is clear that you know based on the notes about ethnicity at least you know museums still have a long way to go in you know, calling to question such presentations and working towards a more accurate representation of the human story. Um, now, I know, uh, Albert, you've talked a lot about um, museums in like a paleontology context mm -hmm. with me in the past. So I'm curious as to your thoughts about this particular paper. Yeah, uh, but it sounds like a fascinating study. And I think it's a, it's a very important one, too, because, of course, museums, uh, museum exhibits are intended to be educational and so it definitely is important for us to get an understanding of how do people actually perceive them what kind of information they are taking away from these exhibits um whether you know justifiably or not um and yeah i think uh, i think this is a this sounds like a very illuminating study and um, perhaps it can help pave the way to uh for improved museum exhibits and um, definitely, I, th I think anything to do with um, you know, education and learning and uh, you know how how people in, um, engage with with these things is, is is a very interesting field of study. Oh yeah, um, and like all the transcripts are on that paper, um, so when you read through it, you really get a sense of like how is the science of paleoanthropology reaching the general public? Because yeah, all all these kids come with their you know preconceptions and like what they have learned about human evolution and it's very revealing like what things they picked up on and which they haven't mm -hmm. um like you see here in the transcript below you know the, they're they're bringing their information that they've learned about mutations you know when it comes to questioning you know why do the neanderthals look the way they do um, so that's just very illuminating and uh, uh i particularly enjoyed reading through this paper so um let's move on now to the next slide um and we have some new primates. Huh. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's pretty rare nowadays for zoologists to find completely new species of right. animals. Um, the main sources of discovery for new species tend to come from revisions of previously known mammals right. that reveal hidden details of biodiversity. Um, and if the distinctions between two populations of the same type of mammal are determined to be great enough, based on either molecular or morphological or ecological data, mm -hmm. then they may be split up into their own respective species or even genera. And the recent examples on this slide show just that. So there was a big molecular study on Wakari monkeys by a Felipe Silva and colleagues that found that the four subspecies of the bald Wakari, so Kakajau calvus, had actually begun to diverge from each other around 300,000 years ago as different Amazonian river basins developed. And they suggested that these four subspecies be elevated into species in their own right, mm. while at the same time also coining a brand new species from a population in the Rio Tiruaca Basin, which is shown here. This is a Kakajau Amuna, the Kanamari White Wakari. Um, and then uh, Avijit Ghosh and colleagues performed a similar molecular study on the threatened Arunako macaque, so a macaque munzala, 
of the Arunakul Paradesh in uh, India, which demonstrated that its two populations had allopatrically speciated around 1.96 million years ago, almost 2 million years ago. Um, and they had used the Sela Mountain Pass as a divider. And so they thus proposed that the Sela Mountain population become its own species, which they call Macacacelli, the Sela macaque. Now, in terms of primate genera, uh, we have a study by Isabella C. Burko and colleagues that created a fully revised classification of tamarins mm. based on phylogenetic research. They were able to confirm a previous arrangement that found a distinction between the lion tamarins, so Leon Sosibus, uh, and the other tamarins, uh, Sanguinus. But this time, uh, they've chosen to elevate the three subgenera, this is a term that is sometimes used in classification, mm. it's below the genus, um, of Sanguinus into genera in their own right. Mm. Mm. So those three lineages had undergone rather ancient branching events between 9.3 and 7.2 million years ago and is well documented by their differences in morphology behavior and ecology so while species like the golden-handed and pied tamarins get to remain in the genus sanguinus we now also have uh we, we now also have the genus tamarinus mm -hmm. for species like the mustached and mottled-faced tamarins and the genus uh, edipomitus for the cotton top marmarin and, and friends. And so finally, uh, we have a study by K. Nicaris and Vincent Nijman, which provided a new genus name for the pygmy loris. This is Xanthonitisibus. Now, this is not a new proposal, but given the secretive nature of lorises, it had been difficult to get good data on them in the past. Mm -hmm. Hence, the duo behind this study have combined a vast array of new information to provide further support that this genera should be split. Um, notably, uh, the median phylogenetic split between the pygmy loris and the slow lorises of which it originally belonged in that genus um, was around 10 and a half million years ago. And so giving them more than enough time for the two genera to develop their own characteristics. Um, the pygmy loris in particular is unique in that it is almost always giving birth to twins. Hmm. And it lives in very large multi-male, multi-female groups and actually undergoes seasonal changes in coat color and body mass, which, you know, for a primate sounds kind of strange, mm -hmm. but that is a thing that happens. So, yeah, definitely, um, you know, should further research support these proposals, we now have a couple new changes to primate taxonomy. Um, yeah, what do you think about that, Albert? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh I think, um, like I mentioned, I believe, in Dinosaurs, the second chapter, uh, most, quote-unquote, discoveries of new bird species are in a similar vein as, as modern bird species, that is, um, where the majority of new species aren't so much previously unknown species, but uh, kind of previously known populations being split up into different species or being recognized as different species. And uh, yeah, I think uh, sometimes these decisions can be kind of controversial because you get into the question of how different do these groups have to be to be considered different species. And uh, people might even uh, accuse these decisions of being, say, politically motivated, for example. Oh, it's, uh, it's you know, um, you, you get more street cred for, for naming a new species than, than not than just recognizing a distinct population or something. Um, or, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it can be uh, easier to gain conservation um, support for a distinct species. Um, but sometimes uh, I, I think uh, these decisions can be quite justified, uh, especially if there are very clear indicators of um, distinctive uh, morphology or ecology. And uh, if these populations don't interbreed, or at least not much, I, I think uh, it, it, can be, it's, it can be quite um, readily justifiable in, in those cases. Um, and I think regardless of the nomenclatural and taxonomic decisions that is like whether or not we should consider these groups different species or genera or whatnot um the important thing about all these studies is that we are gaining a much deeper understanding of the uh, diversity and evolutionary history of all of these lineages and uh, that is valuable in itself absolutely i couldn't agree more <laughs> um 
So speaking of primate evolution, if we jump to the next slide, um, this is an interesting paper. Hmm. So in primatology, there is something called the riverine barrier hypothesis, or the RBH. It's a model which proposes that the formation and spread of river systems play a key role in the evolutionary history of primates, which is an idea that dates all the way back to Alfred Russell Wallace in 1852. Now, in the case of this May 2022 paper by uh, Mariek C. Janak and colleagues, it has been argued that the spread of the Amazon, Rio Negro, and Madeira rivers influenced the spread of neotropical monkeys by separating populations from one another, encouraging the origin of various species of capuchins, marmosets, spider monkeys, and so forth. And the authors wanted to test whether the RBH could actually be supported in this part of South America. So they ran a very massive mitochondrial DNA study on 205 species of platyrrhines, which was marked chronologically and compared with the localities of each population with respect to what rivers they live near. And according to the paper, the authors found mixed support for the RBH, meaning that it worked to explain the evolution of some lineages, mm -hmm. but not others. So, for example, marmosets, tamarins, and bearded sake monkeys appear to have been influenced by the Amazon River, with their divergence times closely, uh, uh, closely with the minimum age of the Amazon itself at about 2.4 million years ago. But at the same time, the splits between species of spider monkeys, squirrel monkeys, capuchins, and titis occurred after the formation of the Amazon, meaning that the different populations were not affected by such a large river system as had been proposed by the RBH. Uh, the history of their lineages would thus have to be explained in another way. Hmm. Um, the Rio Negro also showed a similar signal for influencing primate evolution. So the capuchins, titis, and wakaris seem to have been affected by the presence of the river, but howlers and squirrel monkeys were not. Hmm. And what's especially weird is that while the Amazon did not appear to be a barrier for Wakaris in particular, the Rio Negro was, despite the fact that the latter is much narrower mm. in its banks. So it, it may be that in many cases, we have to look for other means to explain the story of platyrrhines in Amazonia. And so the authors offer some ideas that people can look into in later studies. Um, ranging from vegetation and soil properties to the presence of floating islands uh, along these riverways, which essentially is like a small version of the common hypothesis of how ancestral platyrrhines got to the Americas to begin with mm. by, you know, floating on these rafts of vegetation right. after a storm. Um, so, yeah, this will definitely make exciting research in the future. Um, but it's a very curious study because uh, platyrrhines aren't exactly known for being you know, great swimmers, mm -hmm. which makes the fact of their speciations occurring after the formation of these huge river systems very intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I'll add that very similar hypotheses have been proposed for a lot of South American birds as well. And you might think that it shouldn't matter so much to birds because birds can fly, but um, a lot of <laughs> rainforest birds um, actually don't like to fly for very long distances. So they, they tend to only stick to short kind of gaps between trees and they will um, hesitate to cross large stretches of water. Um, and so there have been a lot of studies trying to correlate the formation of river systems with speciation events in um, um, South American rainforest birds as well. And yeah, I think um, in some cases, uh, we've had very similar conclusions that certain groups are more affected by the river um, barriers than others, um, which is not entirely unexpected. And yeah, so I, I, I would be interested to look into this more and see if um, there are similar patterns going on with the with the primates and with the birds. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely a lot of interesting future research that could be done on this uh, topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's shift away from monkeys and go to the apes mm -hmm. on the next slide. Um, so on several episodes of our show, we've talked about the pros and cons of using certain skeletal features in determining the life ways of hominins and other primates. Um, one example includes our very first episode 
where we discussed a July 2020 paper by Federica Landi and colleagues that demonstrated how inappropriate the foramen magnum, that is the hole in the bottom of the skull where the spinal cord attaches, is in finding out whether a primate moved bipedally or quadrupedally. Um, and now we have two more skeletal features that we can add to that list. <laughs> So first up is the Marine Casanave and colleagues in their June 2022 paper on the calcar femorale. So this is a bone of the upper part of the femur, which connects to the pelvis. Now, previously, this feature was seen as an important aspect of bipedal locomotion mm -hmm. in humans, aiding with load bearing and weight transmission. Other apes and monkeys have a calcor femorale, of course, but ours is in such a unique arrangement that it was argued to be a key feature in the hominin body plan. If you found a hominin with that arrangement, chances are it was an obligate biped like us. And so the authors of this study analyzed the femurs of all the living great apes, um, as well as some baboons, and several extinct species of hominins and other apes to see whether they were able to confirm the validity of that arrangement. And they found that, no, it's not a reliable feature. In all the standard measurements they took of the calcor femorale, only one was consistent with human bipedalism. Hmm. And the rest varied in such wide amounts, not only between species, but within species. Hmm. You know, to the point where apes we knew were bipeds, like Paranthropus robustus, lacked the bone altogether, and apes we know are not habitable bipeds, like, you know, uh, one specific gorilla that was seen in this paper, they had the human condition. Hmm. So it seems that, yeah, this bone alone is not enough to determine bipedalism. And the same goes for the uh, talar trochlear. So this is um, the surface of articulation for the tibia and fibula, where it's located in the ankle. Uh, like the calcor femorale, uh, the human variants of the talar trochlear appeared to be specifically adapted to bipedal locomotion. Uh, the shape and surface of that bone allows for the range of motion needed for a habitually bipedal foot. In other living great apes, like chimpanzees, this bone is larger to allow the foot to rotate and grasp branches more easily. So, as the argument went, if you found a fossil ape with a human-like talar trochlear, chances are it's a biped like us. And if you found one with a gorilla or chimp-like um, dimension, it was likely an arboreal ape. Well, Shuhai Nozaki and colleagues in their December 2021 paper say, not quite. They performed a large comparative analysis with all the great apes, as well as some Japanese macaques, uh, making appropriate three-dimensional measurements of each's talar trochlear, and they found that this bone could not be clearly associated with specific forms of locomotion, especially arboreal locomotion. Now, granted, there was a fair enough gap between humans and the other apes, but in some ways, the talar trochlear showed more similarities between humans and orangutans, hmm. which are two apes that have very different lifestyles. And so, like the calcar femorale, the talar trochlear is probably not a good bone to look at in isolation mm. to determine whether a fossil uh, species was arboreal or bipedal. Um, that's kind of interesting. Mm. Um, have you seen any um, studies like this in bird evolution, Albert? Uh, yeah, to, to an extent, there definitely have been um, studies which try to correlate um, you know, anatomical features with function, which is a, because we too are interested in um, how fossil birds or bird-like um, dinosaurs uh, lived. And so people have definitely tried to correlate uh, things like the shapes of certain bones um, with uh, lifestyles. And yeah, uh, oftentimes we get pretty mixed results there too. Um, uh, sometimes uh, assumptions uh, that we might have made about whether certain shapes correlate with certain uh, functional aspects uh, aren't aren't always don't always hold up to to further scrutiny um so much like cases like this and uh, yeah i i think uh, from one perspective uh, studies like this uh, or at least the, their conclusions can be a little disappointing because like oh no we have to kind of go back and reevaluate everything and it's not not so not not as easy as we thought but um on the other hand i think 
uh, well, first of all, we, we should be kind of used to this, right? Nature is always, at least a lot of the time, much more complex than we, than we assumed. Um, and also, uh, it is definitely very important to have studies like this that kind of ground truth our assumptions and uh, kind of give us a more nuanced picture of how uh, um, anatomy and function correlate with each other. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't figure out whether or not some of these fossil forms were, were bipedal or arboreal or whatever other kind of lifestyle you want to look at. Um, it just means we have to be a lot more careful about it with our interpretations. Um, and yeah, so I, I do think this is very important work to do. Um, and it is, it is interesting to see, you know, uh, how these, uh, how these complications, um, have arisen from recent research. Oh yeah, definitely. Well said. Um, really makes you think about the team behind Artipithecus ramatus, mm. the famous arty specimen. Um, they really made sure to do studies like this to really, you know, piece together how that, that hominin moved. Um, and like, it was one of the more comprehensive studies in the history mm. of paleoanthropology right. based on what they described. So yeah, definitely good to see papers like this, even if they can be disappointing at times mm -hmm. and certainly frustrating in others. Um, in the case of something like Sahalanthropus, where mm -hmm. we only have so few bones, and it's like, oh well, one of the main ways that we've been saying that this this hominin was a biped was like the brain and magnum. Right. But it's like, oh well, that can create a false and present because we have like arboreal uh, monkeys that have the human like position of their frame and magnum. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something that like that is going on with Sahalanthropus, but we, we would really need, you know, more complete remains to further verify or deny that sort of possibility. Mm -hmm. So moving on from morphology to behavior on the next slide, um, it's well known that chimpanzees use tools. And the one type of tool use you know, has been well reported in recent decades. That's the use of rocks to crack open tough forest nuts. Uh, the population at Boso in the Republic of Guinea particularly likes oil palm nuts and they are one of the few chimpanzee communities known to carry different stones around to use as hammers and anvils. And one question surrounding chimpanzee nutcracking is how it functions from a behavioral ecology perspective, aka what conditions influence when and where chimps engage in nutcracking. So using the Boso population for their July 2022 paper, Katerina Almeida Warren and colleagues studied chimpanzees over a span of 160 days, split up into two field trips, using a combination of field observations and on-site explorations to see if they could find any patterns to nutcracking. It turns out that in order for a group of chimps to establish a tool-using site, a wide range of available foliage beyond the desired oil palms seems to be a necessary prerequisite meaning that there has to be a large amount of non-extractive foods, that is, foods that can be gathered without tools, and available resources for nightly nest making in order to influence chimps to stay in a spot with oil palms and engage in nutcracking. So it's not enough for there to be, you know, just these trees and any available stones to work with. You have to have an overarching abundance of other resources. Uh, if a location consistently produces available goods, chimps will return to the same nutcracking sites continuously. And the authors noted that this sounded very similar to a hypothesis in paleoanthropology called the favored places model. That's by uh, Kathy D. Schick and colleagues, in which early hominins chose stone tool working sites based on desired conditions and would return to them consistently. So the fact that chimpanzees seemingly follow a similar protocol may be key evidence to support that hypothesis, hmm. even if their tool-making strategies uh, vary significantly from hominins. Mm -hmm. So let's move on now to the next slide. And uh, this is this is one of those papers that was really big huh. when it yeah, came that's out. Right. So the, uh, the Sturkfontein Caves in Gauteng, South Africa, are one of the most important sites in the history of paleoanthropology. For it was here in the 1930s that Raymond Dart and Robert Broom and colleagues uncovered the remains of the first adult Australopithecines, notably specimen STS-5, or Mrs. Plez, shown here on the left, who was an Australopithecus africanus. 
Now, these fossils corroborated Raymond Dart studies of the earlier known Tong child as an early human ancestor, or something close to that, as well as centering the discussion of human origins to Africa. And since that time, other, more complete remains have been unearthed, including specimen STW573, or Littlefoot, which is shown here in the middle. And the research on that specimen is still ongoing. Well, this June 2022 paper by Daryl Granger and colleagues has certainly thrown a wrench into things. Hmm. So previous work on the dating of Stork Fontaine Caves, and note that you know dating cave sites has always been tricky, yep. given hmm. their geologic histories. They had established that the hominin bearing layers, uh, aka member four, uh, were between 2.61 and 2.07 million years ago, making them contemporaneous with the earliest members of the genus Homo and placing them in the latest Pliocene uh, to early Pleistocene epochs. Um, which is interesting considering that phylogenetic methods and other comparative strategies have seemed to show that Australopithecus africanus is particularly close to the genus Homo. Well, new dating using the cosmogenic nucleide method, which uses the isotopes formed when cosmic rays interact with atoms within our solar system, on remains and layers, the team found that member four was quite older than they had expected. Hmm. Uh, the new date now is entered deeper into the Pliocene epoch at between 3.7 and 3.3 million years ago. Now, should this dating technique hold out, and it certainly clears some discrepancies from earlier studies of the cave site, thanks to the more destructive techniques of the older generations of excavators, this does shift much of our understanding about early hominin history. Mm. Now, it should be noted that the Littlefoot specimen had previously been dated to around 3.67 million years ago, which is thanks to another earlier paper by Daryl Granger et al. in 2015, which would have made that the oldest specimen of Australopithecus africanus. But with this study, we can now add further individuals um, to that date and time, like Mrs. Plez. Mm. Now, other members of the species that are found in neighboring cave sites, like uh, Maconscott, have been dated to between 3 and 2.6 million years ago. But of course, now it'll be curious to see whether those dates are actually accurate too, or if they're about as old as these ones. And, you know, the placing of so many important specimens of Australopithecus africanus this far back in time makes them contemporaries of other Australopithecine species, particularly in East Africa, mm -hmm. like Pranthropus afarensis. And, you know, this has already garnered some murmurings among students of the, uh, the Lumper School that, you know, maybe all of these hominins should be placed into one large species, hmm. um, which would certainly be interesting, but I wouldn't make any definitive statements like that just yet. Uh, the paper authors certainly don't. Because, um, again, you know, phylogenetic studies um, have not found all these specimens to be particularly closely related. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you know, this study is certainly going to bring more questions than answers over the coming year, right. particularly dealing with the environmental context of when these hominins were living in the greater picture of Africa's climate history. So... Yeah, I mean, it's not every day that a particularly famous collection of fossils is redated so significantly like mm -hmm. this. And definitely there's a lot of skepticism that I, I've been seeing, mm -hmm. too. Just, just just people being extra cautious. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I, I wouldn't expect any of our hominin fans or anyone watching to see, you know, you know, Australopithecus africanus 3.7 million years ago, like, seeing that in the literature often. Mm -hmm. Um this will definitely be like an ongoing field of research to just further, you know, you know, redate and redate and just be absolutely sure that, you know, such a drastic change as this is accurate. Or yeah. Not. Mm. Um, but yeah, definitely. I'm definitely curious to see where that goes. Um, so let's move to the next slide now, um, where we have a couple papers here that further flesh out aspects of Australopithecine behaviors that I think are worth exploring. Mm. So first off, we have a commentary paper 
from March 2022 by David Patterson and colleagues, which discusses the extinction of Paranthropus boisei. Hmm. That's the grazing hominin, or as I like to say, the hominin that's trying to be a horse. Hmm. You know, g- given the numerous studies done on you know skulls like this, it is very clear that P. boisei is a specialized primate, and specialization tends to be a handicap to sudden environmental changes. As such, it has been previously argued that the geologic activity of the East African Rift Valley in the middle Pleistocene led to a reduction in the grassy C4 vegetation of that part of the world in favor of woody vegetation, which ultimately caused the extinction of the species as it could no longer compete with other grazers for food. Well, it turns out that the isotopic studies that provided much of the data for such a model, and that is like the environmental isotopes, um, were actually flawed in that their sample size was way too small and too spaced out in time Hmm. to make that sort of extrapolation. Um, We find that similar grazing mammals like ruminants are actually quite flexible across a wide range of habitats, even in areas where there is substantial woody cover. You know, there's still enough grasses and other C4 plants to sustain grazers. And, you know, besides, we do have evidence of Paranthropus boisei in open woodlands of that sort. So that model hardly seems to work in explaining the the loss of that species. Um, And so we should probably be looking elsewhere to find clues as to the why of extinction. Um, I know a very classic hypothesis is that early Homo wiped them out Mm. somehow. But uh, I rarely see that discussed nowadays, so I have to, to check the literature to see if that is um, still taken seriously or not. Um, so next we have an April 2022 paper by Pierre Fremondier and colleagues that concerns hominin birth patterns, which is always a, a rich subject. Um, it has been previously argued based on comparative studies of different hominin skeletons, especially the skull and pelvis, that midwifing or cooperative breeding was at least in place within our lineage at the time of Homo ergaster, when the infant's skull was at a stage of development where care was needed to maneuver out of the birth canal without harming the birthing parent. This often involves a lot of flexing and rotating of the immature infant through an increasingly narrower pelvis, which was itself in a response to millions of years of adaptation towards obligate bipedality. But in recent years, as the remains of earlier hominins like Australopithecines have been unearthed, some with very well-preserved pelvises, there have been arguments that the foundations of cooperative breeding should be shifted backwards in time. And with this study, at least, we can begin to say that, yes, this behavior is far older than Homo ergaster. So the authors created a 3D fetal head model in three neonatal brain sizes, then created simulations where the head passed through reconstructions of Australopithecine pelvises belonging to three species to see what sorts of difficulties were had. And they showed that at certain points, the infant needed to be rotated from a left occiput anterior head orientation in much the same way that humans today are born and quite unlike how living apes perform. Now, the proportions of Australopithecine infants were very much like our own, and it seems increasingly likely that other members of the social group would have helped the parent deliver the offspring. Now, for those interested in this model, uh, there's a detailed representation shown below here, um, which shows the different evolutionary stages in the birth process that are proposed by this paper from our last common ancestor with chimpanzees through Australopithecines and into humans today. Now, lastly, there's a July 2022 study by William Snyder, Jonathan Reeves, and Claudio Tiene that goes into the early stone industries. Now, at this point, a growing picture has been emerging regarding the origin of stone tool making. We know that for the living great apes, it is almost impossible for them to construct napped stone tools, much less pass that skill on through the education of others And based on the earliest evidence we have of hominin stone tools, the 3.3 million year old Lomequian toolkit made by Australopithecines, we find that the techniques used in their buildup were probably very simple. 
nothing more than direct impact of stone on stone. Now, these would have been the antecedents of the old one industry, which was more complex in construction, but still far simpler than what the Ashulean industry accomplished later. Now, this has led some researchers like the authors of this study to conclude that perhaps the conventional model for the origin of stone tool making, that is through a process of cultural transmission via social learning, is maybe incorrect. Now, using human participants that, are, that were naive of stone napping, but you know, were, were required to build a tool to acquire an object, the team found that simple stone napping can emerge spontaneously at separate times among separate individuals. So when a task required a sharp object or a hammer, the participant was usually able to figure out that you know, that's what was needed and nap away without any prior guidance. Even if they had heard of stone tools before, they were still able to figure it out through trial and error without needing an exact demonstration. And it's because of this work that the team forwarded an old hypothesis called the minimal cultural model, which was applied to the old one industry. Now to quote the paper directly, social learning very likely existed, but did not transmit napping know-how. Instead, other types of social learning, likely present at the time, would have merely affected the frequencies and speed of serial, but still individual, re-innovations of this know-how within and across populations. The resulting minimal culture would then, be, would then have been tied to socially affected frequencies of know-how, re-innovation, but not to cultural transmission of know-how. So over time, as more and more individuals develop and redevelop the tricks of their trade, a sort of minimal culture would emerge where everyone is able to nap stone tools without necessarily having had to teach each other to do so. It's less about copying and more about catalyzation. Mm -hmm. In a wider context, we can begin to see how the spontaneous stone percussion that is seen in orangutans and chimpanzees could then develop into the individualized creation of Lomequian or Oldowan style stone industries through the actions of individuals across a region. Hmm. Hmm. So there's certainly a lot to unpack here. Um, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, <laughs> there certainly is. But uh, I think these all sound like very fascinating studies. Um, I think anything that uh, gives us more insight into the life and times of extinct forms um, certainly is. Um, and yeah, I, I, I quite like the, the figure that you put here of um, showing kind of um, the cascading effects, I suppose, of different adaptations um, towards uh, uh, bipedalism and le leading to, uh, you know, different types of uh, reproductive behaviors. I think uh, um, diagrams like that are all, always really interesting to look at. Um, so, yeah, no, it sounds, sounds like a really interesting set of studies, and it's always... Um, always great to know that we're finding out more about this stuff oh absolutely and i mean it's it's really fascinating how much this has built up only you know in very recent decades mm -hmm. i mean it was really like in the 70s when we started getting you know far more complete remains of australopithecines right and you know now we're having discussions about you know cooperative breeding and minimal cultures where you know we actually have more evidence that we can use to support or deny these hypotheses than we did starting out when it was just, you know, informed speculation, <laughs> especially going back to like, you know, Raven Dart back in the thirties. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're really fleshing out these hominins more and more. And I'm, I'm just excited with each new study like this. So let's move to the next slide. Um, and we have a new fossil mm -hmm. that has been described for Homo sediba, oh. you know, what we call Australopithecus sediba around here. Um, a near complete lower back comprising of second and third lumbar vertebrae. Now, these bones seem to have come from one of the first specimens found of the species, which is called MH2. And you know, they had been originally missing from that first excavation. So now we can take those bones and put them back together with the skeleton again, which is good because there had been some necessary questions about bipedal locomotion in Homo sediba and whether its spine was adapted to such movement. And with the analysis of these lumbar vertebrae and their comparison to other hominins, we can now say that while Homo sediba 
was indeed structurally a biped. It was, like other early Homo, still competent uh, in the trees, with a morphology intermediate between later Homo fossils and earlier apes. Which, you know, that makes sense. Um, in one aspect, the long shape of the transverse process, which are the little projections from the side of a vertebrae, that indicates the presence of very strong trunk muscles, mm. which gives the back and hips stabilization while walking upright. So this sort of mosaic locomotory behavior, you know, has been proposed for Homo sediba before. So it's neat that we can actually get some further confirmation on this front. Now, uh, speaking of new fossils, let's jump to the next slide. Yep. Um, and we have two papers here about the very exciting prospects of early Homo in Eurasia. Huh. So one paper by Alain Barash and colleagues, this is from February 2022, is particularly intriguing. The team uncovered a new fossil from Ubadia in Israel on the Levant, belonging to a juvenile hominin that lived one and a half million years ago. It's a complete body of a lower lumbar vertebrae. And you can see that in the top left image here. Now this bone, which has been named specimen UB10749, was found to fall within the genus Homo to the exclusion of Australopithecines and other apes. But what was especially interesting is that the PCA analysis found that it was a member of the earlier Homo lineages and not related to Homo erectus in Eastern Eurasia, which has often been argued to have been the first hominin to leave Africa. Now, in terms of specifics, it is too large to belong to something like Homo habilis. And it's also fairly different from Homo georgicus, the Dominici hominins that are very controversial. And in regards to the latter, the paleoecological data shows that wherever this particular hominin lived, it was in a different environment from the Dominici. Hmm. Um, it preferred warmer and more human habitats to the closed woodland forests of the Georgian specimens. Now, UB10749 is closest to specimens like the Turkana boy, that's a member of Homo ergaster in East Africa. So there are two possibilities here with this particular vertebrae. One is that we have a single dispersal event from Africa in which the ancestors of Dominici and Ubedia diverged early on, or and this is more intriguing considering the archaeological evidence for Eurasian stone industries, we have evidence of two separate dispersal events from Africa, with the Ubadia remains representing the earliest evidence of erectines in Eurasia, and Dominici represents something else, which is interesting because Dominici has been argued to belong to Homo erectus. Um, but they've always been sort of an outlier in terms of those sorts of remains in Eurasia, you know, we now know from previous work that their anatomy is fairly distinct from Homo erectus in the very important details, um, including brain anatomy, which further suggests that the hominins at Dominici and traditional Homo erectus are different. So that's very intriguing. Now, on the opposite end of Eurasia in the Philippines, we find this other February 2022 study by Clement Zanoli and colleagues. This paper involves the newly discovered and little known Homo luzonensis and where it fits in the hominin family tree. The team examined the teeth anatomy, which is one of the few fossils we actually have, mm. and compared them to other hominins, including the nearby Homo floresiensis of Flores Island, in a morphometric analysis of both internal and external features of the teeth. And this data indicates that Homo luzonensis shares very close similarities to Homo floresiensis, but also Homo erectus. And so the authors contend that the two small bodied hominins were likely descendants of Southeast Asian erectines. Hmm. So they're going with that hypothesis. And which would mean that the island habitats caused some extreme adaptations in these two hominins that made them become smaller. Um, but you know that model has definitely you know been contentious for some time, mm -hmm. especially regarding the Flores hominins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
as different bones of those remains reveal different relationships, you know, with some suggesting a kinship with early Homo like Homo habilis. So in this case, you know, we seem to have another score for Pharisiensis and now seemingly Luzonensis as being derived Homo erectus. Um, obviously, your know, more complete fossils of the Luzon hominin would be vital in solving or at least perhaps muddying that hmm. conundrum. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, what, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, um, new fossil specimens are always nice to see, especially of um, stem humans, which are, relatively speaking, not, not that common finds, hardly. Um, so uh, certainly these are very intriguing fossils, even if they're not very complete. And uh, yeah, that definitely uh, ho hope we eventually find even more at least. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, it really says a lot about paleoanthropology that we get, like, little eeny-weeny bones, and they're able to help us, you know, kind of figure out these relationships yeah. um, with, you know, very rigorous methods. Um, the PCA stuff, I, I, I'm always fascinated by, mm -hmm. uh, because, like, granted, you know, phylogenetic stuff is going to be difficult with hominins mm -hmm. in many respects. So this is really, like, the, kind of the second best thing that we got. Mm -hmm. Um, even then, like there's there's still like errors here, but you know, it is really cool to kind of see, you know, these sorts of spectrums that we find in these specimens, um, that really kind of reveal in some cases that there's a lot of blending going on between different um, populations, and that it's it's difficult to think typologically mm -hmm. when you look at re results like this. So let's move on now to the next slide, um, to more recent hominins of the erectine grade. Um, we have a January 2022 study by Karen L. Bob and colleagues, uh, which is a new analysis of the one and a half to 1.26 million year old homo skulls from Gona, Ethiopia, called Dan 5 slash P1 and BSN 12 slash P1, respectively. Now, these had been conventionally classified as African Homo erectus or Homo ergaster by different authors. But this study really wanted to look into this further by creating virtual reconstructions of the fossils and examine them alongside other hominins in a landmark-based shape analysis, which uh, quantifies the features of the bones based on their similarities with other bones. So Dan 5 slash P1 is the smaller of the two, and it shows the most similarities with Homo georgicus and the more complete Homo habilis skull from Kubifora while BSN 12 slash P1 seems to more clearly match fossils of Homo ergaster. Now, despite those distinctions, the authors contend that their data best shows an inclusion of the two skulls into the Homo ergaster species, with the discrepancies in skull and brain size attributed most likely to an increase in cranial capacity over time than to, say, sexual dimorphism which seems to have been a trend that researchers have recorded in erectine populations across Africa and into Eurasia. Now, that link between Dan 5 slash P1 and earlier hominins is interesting because, you know, it may provide a key bridge between the habilines and the erectines that would be expected between these two grades of hominins because they do kind of blend into each other. Um, but for the purposes of this paper, the authors would prefer to label both as erectines, mm. and that you know whatever small shapes there are is based more on allometry than phylogeny. Now, the other study here concerns Homo erectus proper. This is the poorly preserved teeth and jaw remains from the Ganwangling specimen in Lanshan, China. Now, like the Gona fossils, these are important as some of the earliest East Asian specimens of Homo erectus at 1.63 million years ago. For this study uh, from July, 2022, uh, Lee Pond and colleagues kind of excavated the teeth in the computer to reveal their full features and then compared those with other hominins from around the world to see if any vital clues could be gained from you know, which populations the Chinese Homo erectus may have originated from. And you know, what was clear was that the teeth do closely match with other specimens of Homo erectus in this part of the world, which confirms the attribution of these otherwise badly damaged fossils to that larger hypodyme. Yet, among all these specimens, there was an apparent divide in root morphology that was found between the early Pleistocene specimens like Gan Wan Lang 
and the middle Pleistocene specimens, like the famous Chilcotian remains. And that gives the impression that Homo erectus may have populated East Asia twice. Hmm. Now, that would be fascinating to test. Um, but of course, given the sheer gap in erectine remains between Southwest Asia and East Asia, we would need to find more fossils in the middle there and you know, do more of these comparisons in order to be sure. But I don't know, to me, the idea of populations of Homo erectus kind of seemingly replacing each other um, in one part of the world really echoes a lot of the studies that have been done on our own species. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty interesting in and of itself. Um, yeah, what do you think about that, Albert? Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I don't have too much to add to this one, but I agree with you. It is a, it is a fascinating possibility. Yeah, and I, I think with the Gone Wandling study is, is kind of fun because it reminds me of what your team had done and, you know, kind of using the computer to take out the skull of Asteriornis mm -hmm. from its matrix. Right. And you'll hear it, they're taking teeth out of the jaw. Right, yep. That are otherwise kind of hidden in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like, I think that's kind of cool. Um, all right, let's move to the next slide now. And uh, we're going to stay in the middle Pleistocene um, and the famous muddle in the middle, mm. um, which we are once again addressing. <laughs> you know, the, this humongous discourse surrounding the hominins of this epoch you know, that existed between the erectine grade and our species Homo sapiens and how they are related to each other and thus how to classify them. And this has been muddled by a history of research riddled with issues and is likely not going away anytime soon. But nonetheless, there are dedicated people working on this. And we are actually beginning to see some progress in addressing these remains. So this April 2022 paper by Anthony Pagano and colleagues takes a shot at this by focusing on the nasopharyngeal bones of the skull. Um, as you can see in the image on the far left, uh, these are the bones of the region where the nasal cavity connects with the soft palate um, and the hard palate. Um, the team took measurements from this area of the skull from a number of living humans as well as extinct humans ranging from Neanderthals to Homo sapiens and, you know, as much in between as they could add. So we have skulls like Cowboy 1 and Petrolona 1, for example. And it turns out that the shape of the nasopharyngeal bone shows considerable distinctions between different hominin species. So that of Homo erectus is tall and narrow, while that of Homo sapiens is shorter. And this implies that these traits are autapomorphic or specialized to one lineage. Mm -hmm. And that could be a way to help us place many of the middle Pleistocene remains in certain parts of the hominin family tree. So the authors found that Cobway 1 and Petrolona 1 align on the Homo sapiens lineage, while Adequarca 5 and Steinham 1 align with early Neanderthals. Mm. Now, while these bones may seem insignificant, those distinctions in their anatomical characters with respect to evolutionary lineages seems to be a far more secure way of gauging relationships than many other methods so far. So maybe in the future, the relationships of these four middle Pleistocene skulls with other hominins may be validated, you know, all starting with, with this little you know, bitty bone in the skull. Now, if we jump to the next slide, um, this, that is certainly not to say that the muddle in the middle has, is, you know, has been solved, hmm. not by a long shot. There is still the question of the East Asian fossils, hmm. you know, where the stakes are extra high because there is still the matter of the Denisovans and whether we have had good fossils all this time and just had known about it mm -hmm. yet, you know, with the absence of ancient DNA. Um, at the moment, unfortunately, the Harpin skull or Homo longi that we talked about in the first update special, which was one of the big highlights, um, hasn't had any major work done on it since then. Um, but the selection of skulls shown here on this slide certainly can provide more data for us. Now, that being said, this February 2022 paper by Wu Liu and colleagues attempts to examine what we currently have on the East Asian Middle Pleistocene and tries to make sense of it through the use of variant analyses. So just where are we at in regards to East Asia? What well, is abundantly clear, 
based on the PCA studies, is that there are two morphological clusters that are found between the East Asian Homo erectus and the Middle Pleistocene remains. Uh, like the, um, they're, they're two wings on a butterfly, with the gap being bridged by the forty, uh, by the four hundred thousand year old Hexian skull from Anhui, China, and the Hualongdong skull, which is also from that region, dated to three hundred to two hundred and seventy thousand years ago. So we might possibly have some evolutionary bridging going on here. Now the variability in skeletal features in East Asian Homo seems to grow around 300,000 years ago with an increase in cranial capacity to over a uh, uh, to over 1300 cc's um, and the zhushang skull from hainan that even reaches uh, 1800 cc's which is really at the larger end of hominin cranial capacity mm. now basing these numbers um, on environmental data the authors argue that the climatic instability of east asia during the middle pleistocene may have influenced the evolution and dispersal of hominins there, leading to admixture events that lead to the range of morphological traits that are seen in the fossils shown here. So the possibility exists that different hominins living in East Asia were adapted to different environmental niches. And thus there is a possibility of multi-species ecosystems during the middle Pleistocene, including late surviving Homo erectus, Denisovans, and you know, whatever else is represented here. Mm -hmm. Now, while this research does not answer any questions about taxonomy, it does seem to help put to bed um, a rather old notion in paleoanthropology that East Asia is somehow this, this backwater mm -hmm. to human evolution um, where nothing really important happened <laughs> and all the, the lineages were dead ends. Um, on the contrary, you know, here hominin diversity was as varied and changing and important as Africa, Europe, or Southeast Asia. And so I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything to add about this, Albert? Uh, not much, but any study that clarifies that, you know, this very confusing aspect of human evolution, I'm sure is very valuable for sure. Oh, yeah. And um, I definitely do hope that we see more from Harbin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that they're working on it right now as we speak and that, you know, in a couple of months we'll get a new paper, like, boom, surprise. Mm -hmm. Right. Because um, I, I am still very curious if that is a Denisovan right. and if many of these are Denisovans or if there's something even more complex going on. Right. Um, I know a lot of people, even now, they are, they are quick to be like, oh, that's a Denisovan, hmm. done. <laughs> but, like, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we might be, you know, very surprised um, with a new paper that comes out. Um, we just have to, you know, be positive. Now, in terms of, you know, one of the most exciting papers to cover for this update special, we move to the next slide. Um, it also happens to be one of the most frustrating <laughs> because this is one of those really important discoveries yep. that no one seemed to really talk about <laughs> when it was announced. And that may come down ultimately to the title of the paper itself. So, a late Pleistocene human genome from Southwest China. <laughs> you know, goodness gracious, there's so many ancient DNA studies like this that are so run of the mill that are done on early Homo sapiens. Right. That you know, this could easily be kind of dismissed. Like, oh, okay, some new some new DNA, cool. Right. Um, but no, th this July 2020 paper by Xiaoming Zhang and colleagues is a case where, you know, you actually read the abstract and what you see is that we have a mystery hominin that's been fully identified based on genetic material. Mm. Now, some of you hominin fans may remember a 2012 paper by David Kerno and colleagues that talked about a new hominin that had been found in the Red Deer Cave or Maludong system in Yunnan, China sporting a mix of plesiomorphic and apomorphic features that was unlike any other hominins known in the area. Not only that, these bizarre red deer cave people were apparently existing alongside Homo sapiens between 17 and 11,500 years ago, which is way younger than any other hominin species that we know about. Mm -hmm. So what the hell were these people? You know, were they sapiens who had admixed with another hominin? 
were they a new species altogether were they just you know a weird version of our own species you know it was a big question and it went you know many years without a proper answer but thanks to this study we got exactly what we were hoping for and i'm sure what many paleoanthropologists dream of the team managed to sequence a partial genome from the maludong remains and were able to confirm that no the red deer cave people were not a new species they were regular homo sapiens like the rest of us bearing you know the unique skull shapes which is probably just regional variation mm -hmm. um, to be more specific the maludong people represent a previously unknown but now extinct population of early sapiens that inhabited the southern region of East Asia, sharing a common ancestry with the M9 maternal haplogroup, which is expressed in living people from Southeast Asia. In a wider comparison with ancient and living DNA from Homo sapiens, as seen in the map to the right, the team found that the Maludong people represented an early offshoot of a lineage that around 40,000 years ago expanded northwards from Southeast Asia into East Asia and eventually contributed to the founder populations of the Americas. Now this lineage importantly is only distantly related to that which gave rise to the, um, the larger founder populations of sapiens in this part of Eurasia, which is ancestral to the, the Taniwan individual, which is currently the oldest known sapiens in East Asia to have their DNA sequence. Mm as well as you know, the people who would colonize Sunda and Sahul. The ultimate legacy of the Maludong people seems to be that they may be the closest relatives to the ancestors of the foragers of southern China that would ultimately domesticate rice along the Yangtze River Basin. Mm -hmm. And this reflects a wider phenomenon that has been detected in the genomes of humans in East Asia where there's an apparent genetic stratification between people in northern China and southern China and by people in southern China and Southeast Asia that may reflect diverse population histories in the distant past. The incidental discovery the team found was that the Maludong people, like the Tanyuan individual and many other early East Asians, lacked an adaptive allele called OCA2-615 ARG that contributed to the lighter skin of many East Asians prior to 7,500 years ago on the coast of southern China, which eventually spread northward by 3,500 um, uh, uh, 3, years ago, which is almost certainly tied to the population expansion events during the agricultural and imperial phases of East Asia's history. So... All in all, this is a very extraordinary study that was able to reveal multiple details about the early history of Eastern Eurasia, you know, not least of all the remarkable identification of one of these mystery hobbits mm -hmm. that have eluded people for many years. So it's pretty freaking cool. Yeah. And, you know, it seems that now people are finally starting to talk about it, mm. but, you know, it took them long enough. <laughs> um, yeah, what do you think, Albert? Oh, yeah, I, I did see the study when it first came out, and I I did notice that it, it was a big deal. I, I, I read the abstract and everything, um, and it is fantastic that uh, you know, to, to have this mystery more or less resolved, at least for now. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, it, it was really cool, and it is surprising to me that it wasn't talked about more. And uh, I, I agree, it does have a pretty unassuming title, so... Um, yeah, that, that could well have played a part in that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, they could have at least been, like, you know, genome of Malu Dong Haman. <laughs> right. Sequence. Like, that's, I mean, that's even more specific. Yes. <laughs> but, um, no, I, I'm very happy to see this. And, you know, this has been a long time coming. Because, mm. I mean, I remember, you know, in high school, seeing this article about the Red Deer Cave people being really excited. Because, like, I, I was reading more about paleoanthropology at the time. And I was getting it more into my head, this idea about multiple human species mm. coexisting. So it was just kind of cool to see that. Um, I think I even made a, I, I even made a painting um, oh. for like an art class project wow. about this discovery. Um, oh, I, I, I feel like I have it somewhere in my in my storage. But like I, I used the reconstruction of the hominin, um, the Peter Schutten piece, um, which I think he reused for his megafauna book. 
Um, I, mm. I inspired it based on that, right. where I have two Malodong people meeting some early East Asian Homo sapiens um, in in the Holocene, um, and uh, I forget what I made on that project, but it, it was it was a fun painting to do, um, and so like uh, you know, I, I have, I guess sort of like a childhood nostalgia for like the discovery of Maludon, mm. you know, the, the way that some people maybe feel about, you know, the discovery of Sarcosuchus or something like that. Yeah. So uh, it's just, it's like, it's, it's come full circle for me with mm. this paper. And um, it's very interesting to see that this is just, you know, an ancient lineage of Homo sapiens that is for the most part, no more yeah. in the world today, you know, kind of like the ancient North Eurasians. Mm. So very neat, very neat. Um, so let's move to the next slide, and we have some new Denisovan remains that we get to talk hmm. about. Uh, well, you know, one may be a Denisovan, but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, okay, so the first paper comes from Samantha Brown and colleagues from January 2022 and takes us back to Denisova Cave in Russia, where the first groundbreaking discovery of this species was made. Here, using collagen peptide mass fingerprinting, which uses mass spectroscopy, to reveal the identities of animal remains from the minutest of remains. The team was able to confirm the presence of five new hominin bones, four of which could be properly ID'd. And of those four, three had Denisovan mitochondrial DNA and one had Neanderthal MT DNA. So far, so good. You know, one big excitement here is that the Denisovan bones come from a layer dated around 200,000 years ago, which makes them currently the oldest Denisovan remains ever found. Hmm. Hmm. Now, many thousands of years earlier than the other remains from this cave site. And you know what? This just gets even better. That layer also contained a great wealth of archaeological materials, you know, more so than any other Denisovan site has provided us. So, you know, what do we have here? Well, we have fungal remains that indicate species the Denisovans hunted and exploited, so they were using horses, bison, woolly rhinos, gazelles, and deer of various types, ranging from little roe deer to the great megaloceros. Mm -hmm. And many of those bones sport char marks and signs of butchery. Now, we also find the bones of wolves and doles that were argued by the team to have been competitors for resources, including perhaps the Denisova cave itself, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting to think about. Uh, and then we have some stone tools. In some places, 3,000 pieces per square meter. Now, the tools, and some of these are shown below, were made from a variety of typically middle Pleistocene techniques, like the level law. And they include cores, flakes, scrapers, and blades, which is curiously dissimilar to any other stone tool industries from the surrounding area. Um, in fact, in their analysis, the closest parallel to these tools was determined to be the Ashulo Yabrudian cultural complex from Southwest Asia. So, you know, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. um, now, what's especially neat is that the team is able to find organic residues on some of those tools. So they have the presence of fatty acids, and that can tell us that the Denisovans were using those tools for processing animal skins. Now, Unfortunately, you know, while the empty DNA of the Denisovans found here suggests that they belong to a distinct lineage from other Denisovans found so far, so we have, I guess, a, a fourth lineage now that, that we can think about, um, it wasn't really complete enough for the team to use to try and answer the question of whether this particular population shares links with, you know, the one that admixed with our own species as it spread into Sunda and Sahuo. Mm. Um, but for now, I, I think the archaeological evidence provided here is exciting enough. Yeah. Because mm. um, you read about Denise events, but you never really read about their material cultures. Right. Um, but we've been getting more and more of that lately, and uh, it's exciting to think about. I mean, the animal skins thing just, just makes sense, you know, because during that time it was pretty cold there. Mm. So it's, you know, we know that Neanderthals were probably using animal skins, so um, it just it just makes sense. Now, speaking of Sunda, our second paper here is by Fabrice Demeter and colleagues. This is from May 2022. Here we have the possible evidence 
of a 164 to 131 thousand year old Denisa bin that was found inside the Tom Yu Hao 2 limestone cave or the Cobra Cave in the Anamite Mountains of Laos. Now, I say possible because the identification was not based on any DNA evidence, but rather from a single molar from a young woman. And this is shown here on the right. Now, granted, they did use paleoproteomics on the molar tooth, but at most they found that it did at least belong to the genus Homo. Mm. You know, they, they couldn't get more specific than that. Um, so where did the Denisovan link come from? Well, that was based on comparisons with the molar teeth from the Jahi mandible, mm -hmm. um, which was the uh, jawbone of a possible Denisovan that was found um, in the Himalayan region. Um, and there's more evidence for that jawbone supporting that as a Denisovan, or at least a member of the Denisovan lineage. So by that comparison alone, it has been suggested that the Southeast Asian tooth is a Denisovan. Hmm. Now, that sounds really neat at first, because, you know, based on genetic studies with living people, there is a growing suspicion that the range of the Denise have been extended into Southeast Asia and possibly into Sahul itself. And this would essentially make this molar tooth the first actual evidence of this, of Denise have been from this part of the world. But the problem is, and you can probably see where I'm going here, it's one tooth. Hmm. And it's from the lower jaw to boot we don't have any comparable lower molars from denise the cave to be absolutely sure so at the moment many paleoanthropologists are rightfully skeptical mm. that this is a denise in in the first place yeah. mm. in fact chris stringer argued that the team should have identified the molar as a putative denise mm. Mm. just to be safe but still i i think we can safely say that this is still an important fossil regardless of its origin yeah. because, you know, hominin fossils from Laos, you know, especially at an early date as this, are very hard to come by. Yeah. So uh, do you have anything to add about these Denisovans? Oh, uh, not much, but uh, they're tantalizing as always. And uh, like you, I'm especially intrigued by the uh, um, cultural and ecological evidence found found in that cave. I think uh yeah that um even though these remains are as usual not not that complete uh, uh i think they they really do shed a lot of light on the potential lifestyle of these mystery hominins um you know and uh yeah i definitely look forward to further discovery cyclists oh yeah um i'm definitely still waiting for like m way more complete remains <laughs> um you know barring you know whatever a lot of the east asian skulls right. are yeah mm -hmm. you know we are still dealing with scraps for for these species um but uh the fact that we've been able to learn so much already is you know so rewarding in and of itself mm -hmm. that you know again paleoanthropology is a field you know much like paleontology itself where you can take the minutest fragments and you can still gain some very valuable insights yep. mm -hmm. from that alone right um, thanks, of course, to you know a huge comparative data set that we get to work with, um, which is a far cry from the past. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So now let's let's jump to the next slide and uh, let's talk about extinction. Um, and the extinction of the other hominins, save for ourselves, is one of the most controversial topics in paleoanthropology mm -hmm. today. Yeah. Simply because it has been so difficult to find direct evidence of these extinctions beyond the fact that a species isn't found at a site after a certain date. Right. Um, you know, researchers have had to rely on computer modeling to see what sorts of factors could lead to the decline and loss of a population. And we did briefly talk about one such study back during episode seven of Humanity, a prologue, which had argued that the loss of the Neanderthals at least was due to competition and high levels of population expansion by Homo sapiens entering Western Eurasia. Now, while many paleoanthropologists would agree that we had something to do with the loss of these hominins, and I'm certainly inclined to think so as well, there are still gaps in our understanding here. Mm -hmm. And more complete computer models that include more than, you know, us being a factor, like diseases and climate changes, you know, all in one, have yet to have been done. And certainly none have been done with Denisovans yet. 
And so that's where this March 2022 paper by Ali R. Vendati and colleagues comes in. The team used an individual-based modeling framework, which is shown at the far right of the slide, that examined different levels of structural complexity among hominid populations, starting at a period of about 75,000 years ago, to see whether the team could explain the loss of Neanderthals and other hominins as due to, and I'm quoting here, one, neutral stochastic events, two, competitive exclusion due to population-specific characteristics, or three, climate-induced changes in local environmental conditions. And so there were nine different variables that were also used to provide population-specific properties for both Eurasian hominins and Homo sapiens in Africa based on the factors like mobility and life history. And then when all that's done, the team checked their results with previously published hypotheses about hominin history and extinction to see if there was anything that clicked. And you can see some of the results of the study in the maps on the left. So the one on the far right, uh, time moves forward from C to A. Everything in green belongs to non-sapiens hominins. Red is homo sapiens. And the yellow are areas of sympatry. And there were four key things that the paper found. Uh, one was that the replacement of Eurasian hominins by Homo sapiens was explained by a combination of environmental change and resource competition between populations with differing variabilities, rather than any one variable. But in other cases where populations retained identical characteristics, these coexisted for many thousands of years. But two, the dispersals of Homo sapiens into Eurasia appear to have a, de a definitive peak in Southwest Asia. And that has more to do with environmental conditions than aspects of population. Uh, the simulation seems to find support for the idea that there were these green corridors in North Africa and Arabia hmm. that acted as gates, which permitted humans to cross them only at specific times. Hmm. But once in Southwest Asia, the further spread of sapiens mostly depended on population properties, where the simulation found that these peoples could move at astonishing rates of only a few thousand years with a speed of at most 1.2 kilometers per year. So to quote the paper, this leads to the hypothesis that anatomically modern humans, so they're using a little bit of older terminology here, um, replaced the East the Eurasian archaic hominin populations through density competition, while high anatomically modern human mobility would have decreased their local density. Now notice I said that this spread mostly depended on population properties, uh, because the team also noted that environmental factors could and did constrain just how these populations dispersed. So the movement of sapiens across Eurasia appears to have been facilitated in different ways that did not automatically result in immediate losses for the other hominin species. So uh, to the third point here, failed dispersals of sapiens into Eurasia, so those that did not leave a lasting impression, appear to have been the rule and not the exception. Hmm. So archaeological and genetic work has already pointed to multiple instances of homo sapiens entering the continent but not grabbing an extended foothold and this simulation seems to add, add further support to this by showing many instances of sapiens dispersal that did not result in complete population replacements of the Eurasian hominins. And finally, four, in terms of any biological or behavioral insights, the team found that individual factors alone were not enough to explain population replacements. Um, so in one example, there's a popular hypothesis that early Homo sapiens sported a higher rate of fertility than Neanderthals, and that this helped to overswamp their populations into extinction. Yet the simulation found that regardless of whether sapiens had a high rate or a low rate of fertility, there could still be these population replacements, hmm. which makes a factor like rate of fertility um, as you know inadequate to explain species loss. Hmm. And thus, we end the paper with this note, uh, which combination of specific demographic factors 
eventually led to Eurasian archaic human extinction is a question that will not have a unique and overarching answer, neither with this model, nor with alternative modeling approaches, nor in reality. The global extinction of Eurasian archaic humans is a multifactorial process whose causes and mechanisms are locally and temporally diverse as in any multi-species ecosystem. More empirical evidence is required to reveal the high diversity of these mechanisms and ensuing extinction events throughout Eurasia. And so this whole paper has basically been a very long way of saying that it's complicated. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, and certainly this is not going to be the last word on the light Pleistocene hominin extinctions, mm -hmm. but it is nice that we actually have one of these simulations that includes things like Denisovans for a change. Mm -hmm. So many props to them. Um, any thoughts, Albert? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, this definitely sounds like another really interesting study, and uh, definitely uh, simulations like this always have to be taken with some caution because uh, they can depend on assumptions that may or may not uh, hold up. But uh, mm -hmm. obviously, the the more we learn, the more we can factor into uh, the data, or the more we can factor in the data that we have. And uh, yeah, seeing seeing things like the Denisovans being included here um, certainly would help with the credibility of the analysis. And yeah, it does seem that it, this is a this is a problem that it's complicated, and it won't be necessarily be solved by any one study. But uh, yeah, it, it is always interesting to see these uh, these different approaches to to this and um, trying to sort out at least what is plausible and what isn't. Oh yeah, and this is definitely one of those cases where you know this this is a subject that is tied to the megafaunal extinctions mm -hmm. technically. Yep, mm -hmm. um, and that I think regardless of the results, like this paper seems to indicate that you know we can say that okay our species played a role in the extinction of these other hominins but there's no like one reason why we were able to do that right. sort of thing so it could be that there were just it's just different times different places different instances of of, of, um, of different particularities um it's like there's no one size fits all approach mm -hmm to you know us taking out the other hominins um, certainly uh it, it seems questionable at the very least that you know barring you know, the suggestions of a certain someone who should not be named it is likely that we are not dealing with you know territorial warfare mm. between hominin populations right. with defined boundaries and battle strategies uh, <laughs> yeah we um, we don't have evidence of that and it's kind of silly to think about that in that way to begin with because we don't know how a lot of these hominins you know maintain their territories right. we don't know exactly if they were like modern humans today or whether they were doing something completely different mm -hmm. that's part of the mystery but um this is a, a neat paper for sure <sighs> excuse me so um let's jump to the next slide and uh we're gonna shift the question of the muddle in the middle into africa as we come across this infamous October 2021 paper yeah. mm -hmm. by Mirjana Rockenstein and colleagues, which attempted to solve more of the identity crisis of the Middle Pleistocene than it probably had any business of doing. <laughs> so, um, as we had discussed in episodes seven and eight of our series, Humanity of Prologue, two taxonomic names stand out in the muddle in the middle. There's Homo heidelbergensis and Homo rhodesiensis. Mm. Uh, the former name originally applied to the Mauer one jaw from Heidelberg, Germany, and the latter applied to a whole suite of middle Pleistocene specimens in you know Europe and Africa, with the um, uh, the rhodesiensis name originally applied to the Kabwe one skull from Zambia, so back when that part of the world was the colonial territory of Rhodesia. Now, sometimes Cabo one, you know, would be included in Homo heidelbergensis, sometimes not. Uh, and both names have been treated as synonyms of archaic Homo sapiens in much older literature. Um, but because this history of naming has become so confusing, and in the case of Homo rhodesiensis, you know, we have a species name that honors, you know, European colonialism, mm. technically. Um, Roxandic et al. added their opinions to the hat 
that these names should be abandoned. Mm. And their solution is to give a new name and new definitions to these specimens. Now, specifically for the African fossils, the team designated the Bodo 1 skull from Ethiopia, that's here on the right, as a new holotype for their species, which they call Homo bodoensis. Now, this name is also suggested to include other African fossils like Cobway 1, but also Ndutu, Saldanha, Ngloba, and Sale, um, with also some Eastern Mediterranean specimens thrown in, like Soprano. Um, now, temporally, the team chose to have Homo bodoensis represent a time frame of between 900,000 years to the dawn of our species at roughly, uh, in their case, 400,000 years ago. And they use this really weird family tree that's here on the left to make their case. Um, so effectively, all the European specimens um, that had been labeled Homo heidelbergensis in the past would just now be considered early Neanderthals, um, which in some cases is a bit of a growing practice nowadays. Um, we have the Cima de los Huesos fossils that were DNA sequenced in 2016. Those were originally classified as Heidelbergensis, but those were then shown to be very early Neanderthals. Um, so in any case, many of the other Heidelberg specimens would be thrown in there too, like the Maurer one jaw. Um, now, any of the East Asian Middle Pleistocene remains that we had discussed previously in this episode, um, those would still be considered a separate lineage from all of these fossils. Again, maybe they're Denisovans, maybe they're not. Now, um, you, you might think, okay, that does appear to tidy things up a bit, hmm. doesn't it? Um, um, well, I, I think it's safe to say that the reaction to this paper was mixed and heavily bordering more towards the negative end of that. Hmm. You know, by June 2022, we had at least two response papers that came out which advocated their rejection of the name Homo bodoensis mm -hmm. and their reasons why. So Esteban Sarmiento and Martin Pickford noted that the name Homo bodoensis was poorly defined, and its inclusion of the Eastern Mediterranean specimens had failed to account for the variation seen in fossils like Petrolona and Arago that don't actually match these other skulls. And on the more technical side of things, they noted that Homo bodoensis, while being a new name, would essentially be a junior synonym mm -hmm. of two species names that have been previously used for African Middle Pleistocene specimens. So Homo rhodesiensis, but also uh, Homo saldanensis, which was named for the Saldanha skull that was from South Africa. So there were already names available to use or at least reuse and redefine, since very few scholars would even recognize something like Homo saldensis anymore. Um, that name almost never appears in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the response by Eric Delson and Chris Stringer once again, um, who call to attention the taxonomic rules set by the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. Mm -hmm. um, so the Roxondic team failed to meet the necessary requirements for naming the Bodo specimen like they did, as well as discrediting the name Homo rhodesiensis, mm -hmm. um, which Delson and Stringer strongly contend did not have the socio-political baggage that the authors claimed. Mm. Um, I do kind of take issue with that, but that's beside the point. Um, so Stringer made another one of these big Twitter posts um, where he goes into a little bit more details about this. Um, and he calls to question the idea that fossils like the Bodo specimen or even related to Homo sapiens altogether, um, which would render the phylogenetic model uh, that the team created here obsolete. Um, in fact, to quote Stringer, taxonomic names wax and wane according to their usefulness and appropriateness in research, and the muddle should sort itself out given time. So for now, it is seeming increasingly wise to just ignore Homo protoensis, mm -hmm. and you know, don't follow the taxonomic suggestions from this paper. Um, in any case, making it you know, it's 
it would still be too early to fully resolve the metal in the middle in the way that these authors did. Right. Um, cause you know, there is like, we've talked about progress being made. Um, but yeah, this paper, you know, this was one that got a lot of discussion mm -hmm. too. Yep. So mm -hmm. I guess you can call it like one of the really big papers of this update special. Um, cause I know all the paleoanthropology channels that I follow, uh, they talked about this skull mm -hmm. and a lot of them generally agreed that this paper was not very good <laughs> and that like they, they um, th th there was some error in trying to, you know, bite off more than they could chew mm. by doing this sort of thing. I mean, much less like the, the, the tree that they made in and of itself is a, is a real holdover of like the classic school of paleoanthropology where you have like these, these chains of species that, uh, or these chains of descendant ancestor relationships, yeah. um, which, uh, you know, like it looks like a phylogenetic tree, but it's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's very clunky, um, because then you have to argue about okay, well, where does this species end and where does this begin? And you know, why do they cut off Bodoensis at four hundred thousand years ago when the earliest Homo sapiens fossils are three hundred and fifteen thousand mm -hmm. years? So it, it's just it's a whole bunch of stuff that's just crazy. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts about this particular case. <laughs> yeah, I, I did hear about this one too when it came out and. Yeah, I would, you know, obviously I, I'm, I'm not deep into hominin taxonomy, but from what I can gather, um, I, I would generally agree that uh, this does seem to be a, be a pretty questionable decision, uh, both in terms of not following the regulations of the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature, but also just a decision to kind of lump all these things together into into one species. Uh, yeah, just just as a quote-unquote solution to the problem it, it does seem yeah yeah it, it does seem kind of counterproductive <laughs> to that so yeah I, I i also expect that this probably won't be widely followed but i, I guess we'll, we'll see how the discussion develops because I, I do know that the the authors have responded to some of the criticisms themselves um so yeah i guess we'll see what happens <laughs> oh yeah um but nonetheless, like the Bodo skull is really cool. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's really neat to see this sort of, you know, these sorts of remains from like the African Middle Pleistocene, which again is is, you know, is often given less attention than the Eurasian Middle Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but we have some really like cool specimens here, um, and so like if you know, based on what Stringer has been talking about in his in his posts and his responses, that this particular skull may not have anything to do with sapiens at all. Um, but according to him, apparently this may be the link between Africa and Homo antecessor in mm. Europe, mm. which is like, what? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'd be curious to see, you know, what becomes of that. Um, but that, that is a story for another time. Mm. We must move on to the next slide, and we get to another region that gets, you know, very little attention. That's mm. North Africa. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, it doesn't get a lot of attention in popular media about paleoanthropology at the very least. Um, but there is a very rich archaeological tradition here. And we have, you know, many really great fossils of hominins from this part of the world. Of course, in recent years, the importance of North Africa was reinvigorated when the Jebel Earhoud one skull was re-identified as an early Homo sapiens and then redated to 315,000 years ago, making it the oldest known specimen of our species. Now there have been questions about humans in North Africa and how different populations over tens of thousands of years are related to each other. And this May 2022 paper by Inga Berman and colleagues tried to answer these questions using morphometrics on a number of specimens to tease out evolutionary trends and perhaps kinship. So just to kind of give a crash course a little bit, um, beyond the Jebel Earhoud skull and kind of similar fossils from around that time, so there's a Tingneef and the Thomas Quarry specimens, for example, we have a number of remains from the Aetherian cultures who were present from 145,000 to 30,000 years ago, after which we see the Ibero-Morusian or Oranian cultures for short, whom we have ancient DNA from telling us that they are some of the ancestors of the Amazir peoples who live across North Africa today. Now, 
are there any direct links between any of these humans at all in terms of like ancestor relationships? Well, according to the morphometric study from this paper, there appears to be a very long standing regional continuity in North Africa across 300,000 years. So Jebel Earhout and its kin have very robust skulls and thick jaws. But over time, there's a notable gracilization of the mandible and the skull that persists across the Aetherian and into the ibero marusian peoples, which forms a very nice gradient in size that can be seen in the chart at the far right. So, okay, uh, the early sapiens fossils are in yellow, the Aetherian are in the gray, and the ibero marusians are in the red. And uh, by the time we reach the Holocene epoch, we find that the condition of jaw size seen in North Africans and across our species worldwide today is firmly established. Now, in terms of overall skull morphologies, the Aetherians do retain some plesiomorphic traits from the older remains like Jebel Earhoud, which further provides evidence of a link between them. And conversely, the Aetherian and ibero marusian skulls also share close similarities. So, you know, there had always been these questions about North Africa's deep history and how its human residents throughout time relate to one another. So it's nice to see a paper like this clarify things in a very, like, you know, basic way mm -hmm. with these morphometric studies. And, you know, it would be nice, of course, to have more ancient DNA from the older remains, yeah. like those of the Aetherian. Um, just to be sure that this regional continuity is not just an artifact mm -hmm. uh, of the data. But it is interesting to note that the oldest DNA from this part of the world comes from a burial site in Tafaralt in Morocco, which is only about fifteen to 13,000 years ago. And it does suggest a very deep ancestral component for this part of Africa that is equally related to East and West Africans going back many hundreds of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So, is that a hint of this regional continuity? Uh, I think time will tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you have any thoughts on this paper? Uh, not too much, but I agree with you. It is excellent to have uh, you know, such a detailed study on you know, a very uh, underappreciated underappreciate, set of fossils. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so let's kind of shift gears for a little bit to the next slide. Um, and we're going to come to another very contentious issue in paleoanthropology, mm. one that we've talked about a couple times in the show. So all humans today, everywhere, are characterized by white sclera in their eyes. And a popular hypothesis had been that the development of white sclera was an advantage to early hominins because it allowed us to make subtle facial gestures for signaling and communication with each other something that the living great apes were not supposed to do what, the, what, what with their dark sclera. Now, of course, uh, there were huge holes in this hypothesis, mainly the fact that we do have apes today with white sclera. Right. Um, you know, you know, and, you know, it seems that you can, um, you can easily Google photos of apes and, and see this. Um, so, like, it's clear that different species of great apes um, can vary individually in the color of their sclera. So, like, some chimps have dark, dark sclera, some have white, some kind of have it, like, in between. And this can extend all the way to, you know, across the great ape species. Um, and it has not, you know, been very clear whether the sclera color makes any sort of difference in communication among these apes, since it has appeared that apes have trouble following eye movements and require more obvious gestures like pointing with the arms in a desired direction. Well, this March 2022 paper by Fumihiro Kano, Yura Kagabushi, and Yao Han Ling tried to test this directly using human and chimpanzee test subjects. The individuals were required to look at a screen with images of human and chimp faces and had to indicate what direction their eyes were looking at, which is simple enough. And the team specifically tested out the dark versus light sclera by tweaking some of the images of both the humans and the chimps to have lighter or darker sclera. And you can see this 
in the images on the left. This is exactly what the test subjects were looking at. And in a surprise find, it turns out that chimpanzees, as well as humans, had a much easier time identifying eye gaze mm. through white sclera than without. And this is interesting, especially when we call back to an earlier study, which we also covered in our last update special. This is by Kai Kaspar and colleagues from June 2021, which found that scleral exposure in chimpanzees is the lowest seen in all the apes, and that individuals with white sclera do not appear to use them for social signaling like humans do. So what's up with this? Um, well, it turns out that as you read the discussion of the Econo et al. paper, the chimpanzees used in this study had to be extensively trained mm. to recognize different gaze directions, and that many of these chimps couldn't even pass those tests. And to their credit, the authors you know, were not shy about pointing this out, and they did state that more studies should help clarify the results that they had gotten. Mm. But it does seem that you know we have more confirmation now that the whole white sclera of humans thing is singular to our species. Mm. You know, we, we are alone among the apes in using this feature for communication. So, you know, whatever happened in our evolution to make all the members of our species have white sclera to begin with, and not just some of us like in the other apes, would have occurred after our divergence from chimpanzees mm. and uh yeah it seems like it's kind of a weird way to say oh we got a result that we weren't expecting but we also kind of had to really push our chimps to get that result <laughs> to begin with so it's like hmm that's kind of suspicious but uh, let's let's move on now um this slide is going to cover two stories related to homo sapiens in africa mm. um and the first one's kind of a callback to the um Sturkfontein Cave. Um, we have a January 2022 paper by Selene M. Vidal and colleagues, which gives us a new redating of an old fossil. So this is the OMO-1 skull, which is shown here on the left. It's really neat, because it's identical nearly to the skulls of humans living today. Um, and this was discovered in Ethiopia by Richard Leakey's team in the 1960s. And the kicker is that, you know, the skull appear to be of a very old age and subsequent dating efforts have pushed that back further and further than paleo paleoanthropologists had hoped for. So it was originally dated to 130,000 years ago and then that was dated up to 195,000 years ago and now we have this new paper which provides an even more accurate and far older date of 233,000 years ago. And this tells us two things about early Homo sapiens that paleoanthropologists had been suspecting for a long time. Uh, one is that our species has this deeper antiquity in Africa and throughout Africa than we originally thought, uh, which lends some support to the multi-regional model for the African continent. And two, that apomorphic features that characterize our species today were present far earlier in time than we originally thought. I mean, compared to something like Jebel Earhoud, Omo-1 you know, could have been buried yesterday. Um, there are many other early African remains of sapiens that haven't been properly dated yet. So, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see if they converge with these earlier dates mm -hmm. or not. Um, and so the second paper here comes from February 2022 by Mark Lipson colleagues. Now, the genetic history of the Afrotropical region is a fascinating topic right now because it has become clear that the descendants of recent foraging populations today are but a fraction of what they once were, hmm. as agricultural and pastoralist expansions have ruptured much of their home ranges. So, ancient DNA researchers have been trying to sequence genomes from human remains older than these farming migrations to see what sorts of demographic changes were present in the distant past. And here the team were able to extract genomes from six foraging people who lived in eastern and south central Africa up to 18,000 years ago. And they compared these with previously sequenced genomes from across Africa during that time. Now, as you can see in the gene tree to the right, we've known that many African peoples 
can trace ancestors back to several deeply diverging lineages that likely go back over 200,000 years. So uh, the red line are the Southern African foragers, like the ancestors of the sun. Um, the, uh, the black line are the Central African foragers, ancestors of like the Mbuti. Um, and the orange line includes peoples in West and East Africa, as well as all the non-African peoples. So according to this study, the foragers who lived in this part of the world, present day Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia, share ancestry with each of those three lineages sometime between 80 to 20,000 years ago. It seems that following that time, these source populations sustained a long regional continuity in their parts of the world, experiencing limited gene flow over long distances until the advent of the agricultural expansions around 5,000 years ago. There are some clues here to forager life ways in the data. You know, if people are meeting up in these subregions but barely meeting up between them, for such a long period of time, then perhaps we're looking at ancient socio-cultural structures among peoples with small population sizes. I mean, what could have caused this change from the apparent longer distance expansions and interactions among foragers earlier than 20,000 years ago? Well, we have archeology span that can point to a subsistence intensification occurring at that 200,000, uh, that 20,000 year mark um, which is at a time when the last glacial maximum was winding down. So maybe there's a link there. Um, so let's let's jump to the next slide now. And uh, we're going to move on to the expansions of Homo sapiens across the rest of the world. Um, we have this April 2022 study by Leonardo Bellini and colleagues that looks at the heart of the Eurasian expansions. While some of the basics of these movements have been figured out, you know, that they commenced from Northeast Africa, for example, as well as, you know, some of the genetic lineages that spawned from there, there are still some questions about the chronology and geographic pathways these ancestors took. And there are also discrepancies between the archaeological data and the genetic data and what can be associated with what. Thus, the team took to analyzing many of the currently published genomes of early Eurasians from a window of 50 to 35,000 years ago and compared these lineages to lithic artifacts and traditions from that time. Now, as seen in the three maps above, the team managed to recover the following chronology. So there was a Eurasian population hub that was in existence somewhere in Southwest Eurasia and maybe including North Africa, following the main out of Africa expansion between 70 to 60,000 years ago that hung on for a while and gradually gave rise to descendant lineages that spread across the continent. It's here that we see the first admixture with Neanderthals, you know, the trace that can be found in non-Africans around the world today. Now, sometime prior to 45,000 years ago, there was one lineage that entered Europe represented by the genome of the Zlaty Kun remains from the Czech Republic. Now, this expansion may be associated with some of the first non-Mousterian stone tool industries seen in Southern Europe from 48 to 45,000 years ago, by the Silesian, as an example. And then soon afterwards, there was another larger expansion that brought Homo sapiens across Eurasia and into Sahul. Uh, as genetic traces of this can be seen in individuals as far apart as Romania, Siberia, and New Guinea. Notable individuals represented by this expansion include Tianyuan, Awase-1, uh, Basho Kiro, and Ust Ilhum. And it seems that stone industries like the Bohunician and the controversial Shell Peronian toolkits, which make up what is known as the initial Upper Paleolithic, can be attributed to these peoples. And many traces of this expansion. Um, though they were extensive, have been diluted by subsequent interbreeding with Neanderthals and other hominins. So today, the genetic signatures of these peoples uh, in groups today is almost non-existent. And lastly, sometime before 38,000 years ago, there was yet another expansion from this hub, this time repopulating many areas where earlier Homo sapiens had trekked, or at least admixing with the local populations. And it's from this expansion that the Aurignacian and the Gravettian cultures of Europe and their subsequent offshoots emerged and spread into Western Siberia and also contributed significant ancestry to the ancient North Eurasians who would also contribute to the peopling of the Americas. 
Now, obviously, all of these interactions were not one-sided, as alluded to previously with the simulated you know, hominin extinction study. Mm -hmm. um, there would certainly have been some cultural interactions between these different peoples. And we have a February 2022 paper by Ludwig Slemick and colleagues that looked at one very early example from the site of Grotte Mondrian in France. There, the fossilized remains of a Homo sapiens individual had been unearthed in what had been typically been understood as Neanderthal territory between 56 and 51,000 years ago. And so that includes the teeth shown here at the bottom right. Now, this is one of the older sites for sapiens occupation in Europe. And it's associated with a stone industry of tiny points and blades called the Neuronian. And so on the bottom left, there are some examples of these toolkits, along with some uh, associated materials. Now, these had been previously uh, difficult to assign to a hominin, as there were no clear associated industries anywhere in Eurasia or Africa that resembled this. And so according to the authors, it seems that the Neuronian should be properly associated with this particular Homo sapiens expansion. But the big kicker with that study is the sequence of hominin occupation that becomes apparent once you take a deep chronological look at this site. So you have Neanderthals occupying it first, then the Neuronian Homo sapiens, then Neanderthals again, and then Homo sapiens again <laughs> with the ordinations. And I mean, if that doesn't bring complexity to the Eurasian expansions, and I don't know what does. Hmm. <laughs> um, um, I remember these papers being fairly big when they came out. Hmm. Hmm. Um, the big genetic study, too, in particular, is really interesting because, you know, uh, the genetic history of Southwest Asia and North Africa is still a bit gray. Yeah, I mean, there's still some there's still some questions to be answered here. Um, for one thing, to my knowledge, this that particular paper here did not address the basal Eurasian lineage that had been determined from the genetic studies. So that's still kind of an up in the air thing. We don't know if it had anything to do with these earlier expansions or not. Um, but it is a, apparent that uh, when talking about the quote unquote out of Africa expansion. Um, we can no longer talk about just one lineage breeding around the world. Um, we should be talking about these pulses from this sort of hub and that subsequently changed the history of these regions, um, which makes a lot of sense, I guess, from a cultural standpoint. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's jump to the next slide here. And uh, we've got some new evidence for cultural practices of early Homo sapiens in China 40,000 years ago, which is around the time that the Chanyuan individual had lived. So in March 2022, uh, Fang Gong Wang and colleagues described the site of Jama Bay in Hebei, China, which has preserved the earliest known evidence of ochre processing from this part of the world. Now the photos on the left show these remains. Uh, there is a limestone slab where pieces of ochre would be ground down by a hammer stone to a fine powder. Uh, the analysis of the residues tells us that the ochre being used came from different sources, producing different colors and textures for what was no doubt a variety of uses. There was also a new type of stone tool industry that was found here, consisting of small bladelets with microware signatures that showed that they were being used to cut into plant and animal materials. And some of these appear to have been hafted onto bone handles and tied on with plant fibers. So these tools were multi-purpose. Now, to reiterate, this was the first time a site like this has been unearthed in this part of China. And its closest with the Tianyuan remains suggests a link between these two. This is essentially some of the earliest cultural expressions of East Asian Homo sapiens yet known. And the author suggests that there were probably many others around this time that are waiting to be discovered. Now, moving on down south to New Guinea, we have this August 2021 paper by Nicholas Bucato and colleagues that attempted for Sahul what Bellini et al. did for Eurasia, trying to get down to the specifics of the peopling of the continent. Now here the team wanted to pinpoint possible scenarios of routes Homo sapiens could have taken in settling Sahul from mainland Eurasia. They utilized 58 new genomic sequences from living Papuan peoples 
in what is probably the most comprehensive such study done to date. Now, based on prior research, we know that Aboriginal Australians and Papuans share a deep ancestry. Both are very early descendants of that pre-45,000 years ago Eurasian expansion. And they separated early in their history. But the big question was whether that separation occurred after they had landed in Sahul or prior to, while they were sailing across the islands of Wallacea. Uh, according to this study, the evidence seems strongest for a divergence within Wallacea, meaning that Sahul was likely settled twice by Homo sapiens, with one route going through the northern islands into New Guinea and splitting between there and into northern Australia at the least. Um, but unfortunately, there's not enough data to determine where the southern Australian split could have happened. But it could very well have happened at a different time as well. And this tells us that Wallacea was a bit of a medium-level barrier for human expansions. It wasn't difficult to navigate, but it wasn't easy either. Hmm. And these factors may have played key roles in driving genetic differentiation between the migrants. Now, once in New Guinea, however, things get very complex, according to the genetic data. The team found that the expansion began in the southeastern region and took an easterly route across what is now the Arafura Sea, after which groups began to diverge both inland and across into the Bismarck Archipelago. And naturally, groups started living in the lowlands before traveling into the highlands around 35,000 years ago, when environmental conditions seemed to have changed in New Guinea. And these expansions happened at least twice, one from the eastern lowlands and one from the southern lowlands, possibly utilizing river routes. And these highland lowland occupations did not hinder travel, however, because by 30,000 years ago, we see evidence of very large gene flow you know, from this part of the world to as far away as you know, back in Wallacea. Um, and of course, it's in the highlands that agriculture began around 9,000 years ago in New Guinea, which would have further influenced gene flow across the island and beyond. And so a study like this goes to show that even smallish land masses can mm. contain extraordinarily complex demographic changes. Yeah. Mm. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, do you have anything to add by chance? Uh, not really, but uh, you know, I, I agree it's fascinating, especially to learn about um, the human colonization of land masses that are isolated in this way um, as well. Um, yeah, de definitely uh, always interesting to get a more complete picture there and surprisingly complex, like you said. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, the question still remains whether, you know, Sahul was uninhabited by humans mm. prior to our species. Right. Yep. Um, mm. Like if there were Denisovans there, um, how did those interactions go? Definitely a lot of questions. All right, we are we're in the home stretch. We're getting there. Um, we're going to move on now to demographic changes during the ages of agriculture. Mm. We may have two interesting papers that further clarify the types of transitions that took place between foragers and farmers. In the East African highlands, agriculture began to take root around 2,000 years ago with pastoralism beginning much earlier with the introduction of livestock from Southwest Asia between six to 5,000 years ago. Now, uh, Shimalika Gopalan and colleagues for an April 2022 paper focused specifically on the Shabu people of Southwest Ethiopia, one of the few remaining indigenous populations who practice hunting and gathering but are currently transitioning into agriculture. They live alongside a number of farming and pastoralist peoples like the Mahjong and the Shiko. The team examined genomes from these peoples to understand their ancestry, comparing the results with previously published ancient DNA, as well as with contemporary DNA from groups across Africa and Western Eurasia. Studies like this are important because until fairly recently, we have not had very much data on the agricultural transition in regions like East Africa compared to places like Europe, where that story is far more fleshed out. So there have been questions about what specifically happened to the foragers of East Africa. Were the majority of them absorbed by incoming farming populations from elsewhere? Or were they pushed away or extirpated? Or did they just learn to coexist with them? And in some cases, adopt their technologies and cultures. We have cases of all of these in other areas of the world. So what about here? 
According to the results of this study, the Shabu are descendants of foraging peoples who lived here over the past 4,500 years, which is traditional knowledge to the Shabu themselves and to their neighbors, by the way. Um, and they have undergone a severe population bottleneck that kickstarted around 1,400 years ago, going from an estimated 6,000 people to around 200 people. And today that number is somewhere between 1,700 and 2,500. Now these observations fit with other East African foraging peoples like the Hadza Bay and the Sandawe. The latter, of course, have completely shifted to farming. And the correlation timing with the rise of agricultural and pastoralist groups and these population bottlenecks is very telling. Now, we also see from the genomic data that the Shabu and other East Africans share ancestry not only with ancient foragers, but also with incoming Nilo-Saharan and Afro-Asiatic speakers, which also reveals hints of assimilation with farming peoples. Um, in fact, ethnographic accounts tell of many Shabu men taking farmer wives. So it seems that for most of the foraging peoples of East Africa, the rise of agriculture really uprooted much of their life phase, with some groups experiencing population declines, while others made the difficult transition to becoming farmers themselves, even after they had their own bottleneck events. So the next step now for this sort of research is to look even more specifically at these transitions to see what sorts of interactions and cultural drivers were behind these shifts. Now, the next study is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. This is from November 2021, 20, uh, and it looks at Northeastern Eurasia with speakers of the Trans-Eurasian or Altaic language family. So that's Mongolic, Turkic, Tungusic, Korean, and Japonic. This classification has caused a lot of discourse over the years with linguists arguing whether it represents a real language family that can be traced to a common tongue, hmm. or if we're dealing with distantly related languages that just share many features. You know, in other words, the similarities are from loaning rather than common ancestry. Well, here Martin Rabitz and colleagues try to better understand the history of the Trans-Eurasian languages by tying them to population genetics and the movements of agriculture. For this, they attain uh, the team amassed an enormous data set. So uh, there's a collection of 255 archaeological sites from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age. We have the ancient genomes of 19 people, including early Chinese, Korean, and Japanese farmers, the Mongolian steppe peoples, and the Ryukyuan foragers, and a thorough dictionary of Trans-Eurasian words. All of that was combined into an interdisciplinary study to see what sorts of insights can be found about this deep history. Now, in regards to the aforementioned linguistic discourse, it seems highly likely that even if there was a borrowing of vocabulary between different languages, ultimately the speakers of these languages do share a common ancestry. Mm -hmm. And this has been traced to the early Neolithic age of the Amur region. And on the right here, this is shown in red. Uh, between 9,000 and 8,000 BC, uh, here there were early millet farmers who began to expand their farming populations from the area around the West Liao River out westwards in different directions. Some settled the uh, Mongolian plateau to the northwards and then gave rise to the Mongolic languages. Some moved west into the steppes, giving rise to the Turkic languages. And then others moved eastwards into the Korean Peninsula and present-day southeastern Russia, where Tungusic, Korean, and Japonic languages would ultimately derive. Now, we know they were millet farmers from the vocabulary analysis. Uh, the words used by proto-trans-Eurasian farmers and their earliest descendants reference millet, but not other crops like rice. And we also know that they were likely pig farmers, owned dogs, harvested acorns, walnuts, and chestnuts, and produced textiles. And then later on, these disparate farming peoples made contacts with other farmers from the Huang Ho or Yellow River Valley during the late Neolithic, where they shared more words, they shared crops like rice, and ultimately genes with each other, such that during the Bronze and Iron Ages, many of the Trans-Eurasian peoples had ancestry shared with both the Amur and Huang Ho early farmers. And this is especially notable for the Proto-Mongolic and Proto-Turkic speakers, because the team noted that it was during the late Bronze Age 
that these peoples acquired horses and the associated dairying and herding practices that would heavily influence their descendants. Now, the data for the Japanese archipelago is also very notable. Now, we had talked extensively about these demographic transitions here in episode 11, and the results of this study have thrown some wrenches into the equation. Notably, the Jomon peoples, which were traditionally taken as the original foragers of Japan, actually had extended ancestry into the Korean peninsula hmm. around 6,000 years ago, with some Neolithic Koreans sharing 15 to 20% Jomon ancestry, which is more than the Japanese have today. So it seems that the Jomon people probably didn't contribute very much to later Japanese history at all. Hmm and that the Jomon actually made their own expansions into Korea and, based on archaeology, almost completely adopted Korean material cultures like pottery, which is why that signal had been difficult to determine <laughs> initially. Mm. Now, the data from the Yukon Islands is interesting, too, as this appears to be the first study to sequence the ancient genomes of the peoples living there. There had been a previous hypothesis that the Austronesian expansion from Southeast Asia had included an incursion northwards into these islands. And while this new study doesn't fully discredit that model, the samples from the island of Miyako show around 25% Jomon ancestry. And that suggests that this culture had actually extended much further south than was anticipated. And yeah, th these sorts of studies are really fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Especially when they have such comprehensive data sets yeah. mm. and use this sort of interdisciplinary method. And uh, I definitely hope to see more like this in the future. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Albert? Uh, I don't have much to add, but uh, that is very cool. And I agree with you that this kind of big data set interdisciplinary approach can be very enlightening. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just really neat that, I mean, I remember reading about the Altaic language family and, and the the discourse surrounding that so it's neat that we have such you know a vast amount of data that suggests that yes this is a real language family after all mm -hmm. um which uh had been suspected but you know now we have some better evidence to back that up um so let's jump to the next slide and we're going to enter the pacific islands for a bit to talk about three papers uh, the first is the june 2022 paper by ben sean colleagues it seems to have pinpointed the origin of the Lapita culture, which gave rise to the outrigger boat and subsequent aid in bringing people across the greater Polynesian islands. Uh, it had been argued for some time that the Lapita culture must have had contributions from the indigenous peoples of New Guinea, given how close Lapita sites are to the island. And it's thanks to this study, we now have a new archaeological site called Gutunka on Brooker Island in the southeast of New Guinea dated between 3,480 and 3,060 years ago. Here, the team excavated a number of objects and animal remains that are very characteristic of the Lapita culture. We have the bones of dogs and pigs, as well as the rats that uh, look remarkably similar to the Polynesian rat, so that's mm. the Rattus exultans. Mm. Um, all animals that we know were introduced from Southeast Asia. We also have 272 Lapita-type uh, pottery shards, that are arranged in the layers in such a way that is close to other sites in the Solomon Islands where local peoples interacted with settlements of Lapita peoples through social networking. And we also see changes in human behaviors too. At the Gutunka site, we see the first instances of intensive reef harvesting of fishes and sea turtles, which is a Lapita trait, where the number of bones from these animals skyrockets from previous layers. Um, in one instance, actually, there was an 18% increase in turtle bones. And some of these are associated with Lapita-style bone points, flakes, and blanks. Now, lastly, we also see the rise in obsidian trade at this site, where the sources were traced to Ferguson Island in the east. And these same obsidian pieces were found even further east in Vanuatu. And that tells us that the Lapita were, in, were importing these rocks across such wide distances early on. Thus, it seems that New Guinea did contribute a fair amount to the Lapita expansion, hmm. even in the earliest stages, to the point where they influenced which islands were visited first. Now, moving on, 
to a more mysterious specific expansion, we turn to a July 2022 paper by Yu Shei Liu and colleagues about Micronesia, which is the chain of islands to the immediate east of the Philippines. The settlement of these islands appears to have occurred slightly earlier than the Lapita expansion into Polynesia. So that occurred roughly 3,500 to 3,200 years ago. Um, and it's also characterized by a distinct type of pottery called Mariana's Redware, which matches those from the Philippines as well as Sulawesi. And we know of linguistic connections between Micronesian languages and the earliest branches of the Malayo-Polynesian family. So at the very least, archaeologists have deduced that people boated from these islands to Micronesia, but we have had very limited genetic data to back that up. And so here the team provides for the first time the genomes of 164 ancient Micronesians alongside 112 living Micronesians and compared these with genomes of all their neighbors across the Pacific. And as you can see from the map on the right, the team were able to confirm the rough directions of travel to Micronesia. But what was neat was that instead of resulting from one single migration event, the islands were settled five times. Uh, the first migrants arrived from the Marianas, Palau, and the Bismarck Archipelago at some point before 2,100 years ago. And then there was a migration from Papuan peoples before 1,800 years ago. And that hailed somewhere near the Admiralty Islands. And lastly, there was a later Polynesian expansion northwards within the last thousand years that cannot currently be traced to any one island group. Mm. So it seems that indeed, unlike Polynesia, Micronesia was a multi-layered expansion that occurred over many thousands of years. And lastly, we have a bit of an addendum from the last update special, hmm. which we closed on a really intriguing June 2021 study by Priscilla Wehi and colleagues that had argued using descriptions from Maori oral traditions that Polynesians may have sailed into the Antarctic Ocean. Hmm. I mean, they had brought back descriptions of a voyage by Hu Te Rangaroa, who recorded a frozen sea in a dark place not seen by the sun, where the water foamed like prepared arrow route, a.k.a. there was a lot of snow. Now, this had been interpreted as a trip through iceberg-covered waters, likely near the Ross Ice Shelf in Antarctica. Well, in this follow-up paper from the following month that I guess I somehow missed when preparing that last update special, um, Athol Anderson and colleagues say, no, Polynesians probably did not sail to Antarctica. Hmm. Now, of course, why do they disagree with Wehi's team? Well, the reasoning boils down to misinterpretations of oral traditions and the unfeasibility of technology. So in that first case, many of the sightings recorded in the oral stories do not actually seem to have any specific geographic significance. Hmm. I mean, descriptions of things like bare cliffs and hosts of marine mammals are readily applicable to any part of the Pacific. Hmm. Um, the translation of the Polynesian word tiuka apia into frozen sea is especially suspect to the team who argue that the Polynesians would not have had a word for frozen, much less snow, and that the specific word probably means foam, as in sea foam, which, you know, again, isn't really special to mm. any one place. Now, on the second case, the team argue that Polynesian-style outrigger boats would not have handled the Antarctic waters, even if they did manage to make it there. The people would not have had the sort of waterproof clothing necessary to survive the cold. The weaved sails of the boats would have been too fragile for the strong winds and heavy rain on the sea. And even the beams of the boat would have risked breaking. And these are things that are well known to Polynesian sailors. Hmm. So while there have been a couple of sites that have been located in islands as far south as Rakura and Enderby Island, none further have produced evidence of human occupation. So overall, according to the Anderson team at least, the evidence that Polynesians sailed to Antarctica doesn't hold up, and in all likelihood probably never happened, which would mean that Europeans probably were the first people to reach Antarctica. Um, I mean, <laughs> I kind of like to think that it probably did happen, mm. but... The voyage went so bad that the crew had unanimously agreed to just never mention it again, <laughs> which is why we've never learned about this at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, I mean, I, I tease, of course. Um, 
Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, now we're in the Americas, and this last paper on agricultural communities changes our understanding of the rise of farming in Central America. So this is a March 2022 paper by Douglas Kennett and colleagues. We have the genomes of ancient Mesoamericans and South Americans revealing a previously unknown population expansion from South to North. Now specifically between 7,300 and 5,600 years ago, a group of Northern South Americans or possibly Southern Central Americans that are related to the Chipchan speakers of today moved northwards as far as the Yucatan Peninsula, meeting with the local population and contributing roughly 69% of their ancestry to later descendant peoples. Now, what is intriguing about this is that the timing of this expansion fits very closely with the earliest instances of intensive maize agriculture in the Maya region, hmm. where forests are cleared and burned to make room for cultivated fields at around 5,600 years ago in the archaeological record. Now, that's not to say that these peoples introduced maize farming to the Maya. That's not the case. Maize had been around in Mesoamerica for over 8,000 years. But it's likely that what we have here is a case where these people introduced new types of maize and associated growing techniques to them, ultimately admixing together to form a new type of farming culture that is ancestral to the later classic Maya cities, which were supported by them, hmm. which makes a great segue into the final stories of this episode. Cool. So on the next slide, we have an ongoing area of study <clears throat> regarding the Yamnaya expansion, which is the movement of the steppe-loving horse cultures across Eurasia that eventually gave rise to many of the world's language families. On September 2021, Siobhan Wilkin and colleagues provided evidence that a key catalyst to these movements during the early Bronze Age over 5,000 years ago was the rise in dairying. Now, based on ancient proteomic analysis of dental calculus among Yamnaya individuals, it was shown that horse milk was an economic staple of these pastoralists, and that the domestication of the horse by their ancestors laid the foundations for their movements across the steppes and beyond. People began to shift their subsistence practices towards the procurement of horse milk and other products, and through the management of their herds, move their settlements away from their Pontic Caspian homes along the rivers and out into the open plains, where the evidence for Kurgan style burial mounds becomes first apparent. That is typical of the Yamanaya culture. In fact, it is probably because of this heavy reliance on horses that the Yamanaya were able to survive on the steppes in the way that they did in the first place. Indeed, as explained in episode 11 of this series, many pastoralist groups rely on their herd animals for so many resources that in some cases they were able to move into regions previously unoccupied by permanent settlements. Uh, certainly the acquisition of the horse by various Native American nations allowed them to finally penetrate the Great Plains and live as nomads permanently among the grasslands. And so it seemed for the Yamnaya long before them. Now, let's jump to the next slide. And this is our very last paper. Hmm. In episode 12, and in subsequent releases, like our review for The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengrow, there has been a long discourse about the nature of cities and urbanism, traditionally referred to as civilization. Cities have often been defined by a series of strict criteria pertaining how groups of people are supposed to live and function together. But as we look through the archaeological and historical records, we find that these definitions often hide a lot of diversity and even misrepresent how certain ancient societies actually functioned. So archaeologist Michael Powell Ledbetter has written a January 2022 thesis for his model called The Fluid City, Urbanism as Process. Now here he pulls from a number of different sources, including the cities of Southeast Asia and pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, to show that cities should be best viewed as dynamic, ever-changing social entities stemming from associations between humans, other organisms, and their environments. So rather than being viewed as static alien habitats encroaching onto natural ecosystems, cities should properly be seen as multi-species relationships. Mm -hmm. Indeed, many species of plants and animals have contributed to the growth of cities, be it their roles in agriculture or in foraging, to the use of you know, their use as tools in construction. Now, in terms of the city as a collaboration with the environment, 
Ledbetter cites examples from Southeast Asia between 600 and 1600 AD, where city life was dominated by a model of amphibious urbanism, which is defined as continuous movement of people and materials across waterways and wetland environments and the constructions of dwellings and economic centers right on the water. These cities are designed to exist simultaneously with the daily and seasonal changes that wetlands undergo, including changes in tides and in the monsoon season. These societies are clearly cities, and yet they lack many of the features that have been used to classify cities in the past. So Muchuan in the southern Philippines was a wetland city occupied over many centuries that contributed extensive trade relations in gold as far as China and the Indian Ocean. Yet it had no irrigation, no walls, no writing, and no monumental architecture, temples, or palaces. Cities like Butuan date back many centuries, and today these models are common not just throughout Southeast Asia, but in sites around the world, from the Americas to Europe as far back as the Bronze Age. And what is key to the urbanism as process model is that these cities often changed localities continuously across their, their lives, and this was an adaptation to life on the water. So should a flood or a drought occur, people could literally move their settlements to new riverways or water systems and then return back if they so choose. Now, I'll leave more of the details for our viewers to check out in the original paper because it is open access and is a very fun read. Mm. Um, but, you know, it definitely provides a necessary update to how historians and archaeologists should think about cities and urbanism. Mm. Um, Albert, do you have any thoughts on that particular aspect? I think um, those are some very good points, and uh, they definitely kind of parallel some of the uh, themes we've talked about uh, in uh, in the review of Dawn of Everything, but also in the previous update special too. Kind of uh, these changing mindsets that are required when when thinking about urbanism and uh, what makes a city, and uh, we we sometimes have to be more uh, more fluid and uh, uh, more nuanced, I guess, when when thinking about the subject than perhaps traditionally has often been the case. So yeah, that, that is a very nice update to end on. Absolutely, and as it should be a lesson for all of paleoanthropology and anthropology in general. You know? um, but with that, that is the end of this update special. This certainly was a doozy. Um, but I hope you all appreciated these new studies and we'll hopefully look forward to many more new studies in the next update special and beyond as we continue our series through time and clay. Mm -hmm. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today. Um, if we go to the next slide, you can see that we are on Patreon. If you wish to go, you can send donations to patreon.com slash two time clades. All amounts are welcome if you so choose, but either way, your contributions would help us continue this series. And we are very fortunate to have uh, about four Patreons currently, and all of them are at a tier where they are uh, given shout outs. So, we want to give our special thanks to my sister Julie and our good friends Alari in Denver, as well as uh, our other uh, contributor Paul. Um, and of course, we have our general acknowledgments. We want to thank our good friends Henry and Alicia for their contributions for the series. Henry, of course, provided the wonderful theme music to our series, and Alicia provided the color scheme for Albert's Algosaur Avatar. And of course, I want to thank Drew Franklin again for letting us use his Jaguar portrait. Um, it's a very beautiful piece, and I look forward to sharing this episode with you when it is released. And thank you again for inspiring me to create that U.S. Jaguars article in the first place. Um, and of course, we are on Twitter. We are at Time and Clades. If you want to see updates for new episodes, you can follow us there. Of course, you are most likely watching us on YouTube. We are YouTube through Time and Clades. You can uh, subscribe if you so desire and follow us for updates. Um, if you have any questions for the show, whether it's questions directed to us or to the subjects covered in this series, or anything in between, you can send us an email, timeandclates at gmail.com, or you can send us a tweet to our Twitter, or you can comment in the comment section below. We will certainly get to them. And of course, if you want to read any of the papers talked about in this update special, you can go to the description to links for references. We will have a Google Doc available where you can check out each individual paper in order of appearance in this episode. And for the most part, they're, they are, I'd say about maybe 60, 70% all open access. So that's pretty cool. Um, but with that, that is the end of our episode. Um, let's see. Uh, we should have our August news episode coming up soon, shouldn't we? Eventually, yeah, um, definitely. Um, so that's that's something we'll work on. Um, and I would like to uh, do an update special for Dinosaurs, the second chapter in the near-ish future, uh, because we're coming up on a year of that as well. 
but yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I don't know when I'll be able, next be able to record from where I am because um, uh, it's been nice to taking a break, but I do have some work I want to get to and uh, and people I want to see. So uh, yeah, we'll have to work out uh, when we're going to next record. But uh, yeah, we will be back eventually, um, rest assured. Absolutely. Everybody take care. Later.